The Poem of the Man God. The First Year of the Public Life. Volume 1, Chapter 44 Farewell to His Mother and Departure from Nazareth. 9th of February 1944, 9.30 a.m. Begun during Holy Communion. I see the interior of the house in Nazareth, a room which looks like a dining lounge, where the members of the family take their meals and rest during the day. It is a very small room with a plain rectangular table near a chest, which is set against one of the walls. The chest also serves as a seat. Near the other walls, there is a loom and a stool, and there are two more stools with a kind of bookcase, on top of which there are oil lamps and other objects. A door is open onto the kitchen garden. It must be almost evening, because only some faint sun rays are visible in the upper foliage of a tall tree, which is beginning to grow verdant in its first leaves. Jesus is sitting at the table he's eating, and Mary is serving him coming and going from a little door which leads into the room where there is a fireplace, the light of which can be seen through the half-open door. Two or three times Jesus tells Mary to sit down and to eat with him. But she does not want to. She shakes her head, smiling sadly. After serving some boiled vegetables as a first course, she brings in some roast fish and then some rather soft cheese, like fresh cheese, round-shaped, like the stones which can be seen in the beds of torrents, and some small dark olives. Some small, flat, round loaves of bread, about the size of a plate, are already on the table. The bread is rather dark brown, as if the bran had not been removed from the flour. Before Jesus, there is an amphora with water and a goblet. He's eating in silence, looking at his mother sadly but lovingly. It is very obvious that Mary is sad at heart. She comes and goes purely to occupy herself. Although it is still daylight, she lights a lamp and puts it near Jesus, and while stretching out her arm doing so, she subtly caresses her son's head. She then opens a nut-brown haversack, which I think is made of pure hand-woven wool and therefore water-resistant. She searches inside it, goes out into the little kitchen garden, walks to the far end, where there is a kind of a storeroom. She comes out with some rather withered apples, which have certainly been preserved from the previous summer, and she puts them into the haversack. She then takes a loaf of bread and a piece of cheese and puts them also into the haversack, although Jesus remarks that he does not want them as there is already enough food in the satchel. Mary then comes once again near the table, at a short aside, on Jesus' left hand and looks at him eating. She looks at him with love and adoration. Her face is more pale than usual and seems aged by pain. Her eyes are ringed and thus seem bigger, an indication of tears already shed. They also seem clearer than normal as if they were washed by the tears welling up within, ready to stream down a face. Two sorrowful, tired eyes. Jesus, who is eating slowly, evidently against his will, only to please his mother, and is more pensive than usual, lifts his head and looks at her. Their eyes meet, and he notices that her eyes are full of tears, and lowers his head to leave her free to weep. He only takes her slender hand, which is resting on the edge of the table. He takes it in his own left hand, lifts it to his cheek, rests his cheek on it, and then rubs it against his face to feel the caress of the poor, trembling little hand, which he kisses on its back with so much love and respect. I see Mary taking her free hand, her left one, to her mouth, as if to stifle a sob, and then she wipes with her fingers a big tear which has fallen from her eye and is streaming down her face. Jesus resumes eating, and Mary goes out quickly into the kitchen garden, where it is now almost dark, and she disappears. 
Jesus leans his left elbow on the table, rests his forehead on his hand, absorbed in thought. He stops eating. He then listens and gets up. He also goes out into the kitchen garden, and after looking around, he moves towards the right-hand side of the house, and through an opening in the rocky wall, he goes into what I recognise as the carpenter's workshop. It is now very tidy, without any boards or shavings lying about, and also the fire is out. There is the large working bench, all the tools are laid aside, and there is nothing else. Mary is weeping, bent over the bench. She looks like a child. Her head is resting on her folded left arm, and she is crying silently, but very grievously. Jesus enters quietly and approaches her so softly that she realises he is there only when he lays his hand on her lowered head, calling her mother. In his voice there is the sound of a gentle, loving reproach. Mary lifts her head and looks at Jesus through a veil of tears, and with both hands joined she leans on his right arm. Jesus wipes her face with the hem of his large sleeve, and then he embraces her, clasping her to his heart and kisses her forehead. Jesus is majestic. He looks more manly than ever, whilst Mary looks more like a little girl, except for her sorrow-stricken face. Come, mother, Jesus says to her, and holding her close to himself with his right arm, he walks into the kitchen garden, where they sit down on a bench against the wall of the house. The kitchen garden is now silent and dark. Apart from the moonlight and the light coming from the house, the night is serene. Jesus is speaking to Mary. At first, I do not understand the words which are just whispered, and Mary nods her head in assent. Then I hear, and get your relatives to come. Don't stay here alone. I will be happier, mother, and you know how I need peace of mind to fulfil my mission. You will not lack my love. I will come quite often, and I will inform you in case I cannot come home when I am back in Galilee. Then you will come to me, mother. This hour was to come. It began when the angel appeared to you. It is now striking, and we must live it. Mother, must we not? After we have overcome the trial, we shall have peace and joy. First, we must cross this desert as our ancestors did, before entering the promised land. But the Lord God will help us as he helped them, and he will grant us his help as a spiritual manner to nourish our souls in the different moment of the trial. Let us say the Our Father together. Jesus and Mary stand up and they look up to heaven, two living victims shining in the darkness. Jesus, slowly but with a clear voice, says the Lord's Prayer, stressing the words. He emphasises the words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Spacing the two sentences from the others. He prays with his arms stretched out, not exactly crosswise, but as priests do when they say, The Lord be with you. Mary's hands are joined. They then go back into the house, and Jesus, whom I have never seen drink wine, from out of an amphora on the bookcase pours some white wine into a goblet, and he puts it on the table. He then takes Mary by her hand and makes her sit beside him and drink some of the wine, into which he dips a small slice of bread, which he gives her to eat. His insistence is such that Mary yields. Jesus drinks the remaining wine. He then clasps his mother to his side and holds her thus close to his heart. Neither Jesus nor Mary was lying down as was customary in rich banquets in those times, but they were sitting at the table as we do. They are both silent, waiting. Mary caresses Jesus' right hand and his knees. Jesus pats Mary's arm and her head. Then Jesus rises 
and so does Mary. They embrace and kiss each other very fondly and repeatedly. They always seem to be on the point of separating and parting, but each time Mary embraces a creature over and over again, she's our lady, but she is still a mother. A mother who must part from her son and is fully aware of the final destination of his departure. Do not tell me that Mary did not suffer. Before, I had some slight misgivings. Now I do not believe it at all. Jesus takes his dark blue mantle, puts it on his shoulders and pulls the hood onto his head. He arranges his haversack across his back in order to be free when walking. Mary helps him, and she delays endlessly in sorting his tunic, mantle and hood, caressing him in the meantime. Jesus goes towards the door, after making a sign of blessing in the room. Mary follows him, and at the open door, they kiss each other once again. The road is silent and solitary, white in the moonlight. Jesus starts walking away. He turns round twice to look at his mother, who is leaning against the doorpost, paler than the moon's rays, her eyes sparkling with silent tears. Jesus moves farther and farther away, along the narrow white road. Mary is still weeping against the doorpost. Then Jesus disappears round a bend of the road. His evangelical journey, which will end on Golgotha, has just begun. Mary goes into the house, shedding tears and closes the door. She also has started her journey, which will take her to Golgotha. And for us. Jesus says, This is the fourth sorrow of Mary, Mother of God. The first was the presentation in the temple. The second, the flight into Egypt. The third, the death of Joseph. The fourth, my separation from her. As I knew the desire of your spiritual father, yesterday evening I told you that I will hasten the description of our sorrows so that they may be known. But as you see, some of my mothers had already been illustrated. I explained the flight before the presentation because it was necessary to do so on that day. I know, you understand, and you will explain the reason to the father verbally. I have planned to alternate your contemplations and my consequent clarifications with true and proper dictations to comfort you and your spirit, granting you the beatitude of seeing and also because in this way the difference in style between your composing and mine will be obvious. Further, with so many books dealing with me, and which, after so many revisions, changes and fineries have become unreal, I want to give those who believe in me a vision brought back to the truth of my mortal days. I am not diminished thereby. On the contrary, I am made greater in my humility, which becomes substantial nourishment for you, to teach you to be humble and like me. As I was a man like you, and in my human life I bore the perfection of a God. I was to be your model, and models must always be perfect. In the contemplations, I will not keep a chronological order corresponding to that of the Gospels. I will select the points which I find more useful on that day for you or for other people, following my own line of teaching and goodness. The lesson of the contemplation of my separation is addressed especially to those parents and children whom God's will calls to renounce one another for the sake of a greater love. It also applies to all those who have to face a painful renouncement. How many such sorrowful situations you find in your lives. They are the thorns on the earth and they pierce your hearts, I know. But for those who accept them with resignation. Mind you, I am not saying 
for those who wish them and accept them with joy, which is already perfection, I am saying with resignation, they become eternal roses. But only few people resign themselves to accepting them. Like restive little donkeys, you recalcitrate against the Father's will, and you jib, and you even try at times to hit good God with spiritual kicks and bites, that is, with rebellion and blasphemy. And do not say, I had but this good thing and God took it away. I had but this affection and God took it away. Also Mary, a gentle woman with perfect love, because in the Virgin, full of grace, also affections and sensations were perfect. Also Mary had but one good thing and one love on the earth, her son. The only thing left to her. Her parents had died a long time before. Joseph had died some years earlier. Only I was left to love her and make her feel she was not alone. Her relatives, because of me, of whose divine origin they were not aware, were somewhat hostile to her, because they considered her a mother incapable of imposing herself on her son, who did not behave according to good common sense and turned down marriage proposals which could bring prestige to the family as well as material help. Her relatives reasoned according to common sense, to human sense. You call it good sense, but it is only human sense. That is selfishness. And they would have liked my life to comply with their usage. After all, they were always afraid that one day they might get into trouble because of me, as I had already dared express certain ideas which they considered to be idealistic and thought they might irritate the synagogue. Hebrew history was full of teachings on the fate of prophets. The prophet's mission was not an easy one, and often brought about death for the prophet and trouble for his kinsfolk. And there was always the fear that one day they might have to take care of my mother. They were therefore irritated by the fact that she did not oppose me in anything. Nay, she seemed to be in perpetual adoration in front of her son. This conflict was to increase in the three years of my public life, when it culminated with open reproaches every time they met me in the midst of crowds and were ashamed of what they considered my mania for vexing the powerful classes. And they rebuked me and my poor mother. Mary was aware of the moods of her relatives and was able to foresee their future tempers. They were not all like James, Judas, and Simon, or their mother Mary of Clopas. But although she knew what her lot was going to be during the three years of my public life, and was aware of her destiny and mine at the end of the three years, she did not recalcitrate as you do. She cried, and which mother would not have cried because of the separation from a son who loved her as I loved mine, or because of the prospect of a long days devoid of my present in a solitary house, or because of the dreary outlook of a son doomed to butt against the malice of guilty people who took vengeance for their guilt by offending the blameless one to the extent of killing him. She cried because she was the co-redeemer and because she was the mother of mankind who are being born once again to God. And she had to cry for all the mothers who are not able to turn their motherly sorrows into a crown of eternal glory. How many mothers there are in the world? From those arms, death snatches their creatures. How many mothers there are whose sons are torn away from their sides by a supernatural will. As the mother of all Christians, Mary cried for all her daughters, and in her sorrow of a bereft mother, she cried for all her sisters, and she cried for all her sons, who, born of woman, were to become apostles of God or martyrs for God's sake, because of their loyalty to God 
or because of man's cruelty. My blood and my mother's tears are the mixture that fortifies those destined to a heroic fate. They obliterate their imperfections and the sins they committed because of their weaknesses. And in addition to martyrdom, in whatever way suffered, it grants them the peace of God and then the glory of heaven if they suffered for God. The missionary fathers find that mixture to be a flame that warms them in the regions covered by perpetual snow. And they find it to be a dew when the sun is scorching. Mary's tears originate from her charity and they gush out from her heart of a lily. They therefore possess the fire of virginal charity, the spouse of love, and the scented freshness of virginal purity, like the drops of water which gather in the chalice of a lily in a dewy night. Our mixture is found by those consecrated in the desert of a well-understood monastic life. It is a desert because it only lives in communion with God, whilst all other affections fade away and become pure supernatural charity towards relatives, friends, superiors and inferiors. It is found by those consecrated to God in the world, in the world that neither understands nor loves them, a desert also for them, as they live in it as if they were alone. So much are they misunderstood and mocked for my sake. Our mixture is found by my dear victims, because Mary is the first victim for Jesus' love, and with her hands of a mother and a doctor, she gives her followers her tears, which refreshes and urges to a greater sacrifice, holy tears of my mother. Mary prays. She does not object to praying because God had given her sorrows. Remember that. She prays together with Jesus. She prays to the Father, ours and yours. The first, our Father, was said in the kitchen garden in Nazareth to console Mary's pain, to offer our wills to the Eternal Father. When a period of greater and greater sacrifices was about to begin for us, culminating with the sacrifice of my life, and my mother's acceptance of the death of her son. And although we had nothing for which the Father should forgive us, just out of humility, we, the faultless ones, begged the Father's pardon that we might proceed worthily in our mission. After being forgiven and absolved from even a sigh. Because we wanted to teach you that the more you are in the grace of God, the more your mission is blessed and fruitful. We also wanted to teach you to respect God and be humble. Before God the Father, although a perfect man and a perfect woman, we felt we were nothing and we begged forgiveness, exactly as we asked for our daily bread. Which was our bread? Oh, not the bread made by the pure hands of Mary and baked in our little oven, for which I had so often prepared bundles of sticks and brushwood. Also, that bread is necessary while man is on the earth. But our daily bread was to fulfil, day by day, our part of the mission. We begged God to grant us that every day, because to fulfil the mission that God gives us is the joy of our day, isn't it, my little John? You also say that a day is lost, as if it did not exist, if the Lord's bounty gives you a day without our mission of sorrow. Mary prays together with Jesus. It is Jesus who justifies you, my children. It is I who make your prayers fruitful and agreeable to the Father. I said, anything you ask for from the Father, he will grant in my name. And the church enhances her prayers, say, through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you pray, be always united to me. I will pray for you in a loud voice, 
drowning your human voices with my voice of man-god. I will take your prayers in my pierced hands, and I will raise them to the Father. They will thus become victims of infinite value. My voice mingled with yours will rise like a filial kiss to the Father, and the purple of my wounds will make your prayers valuable ones. Be in me if you want to have the Father in you, with you, for you. You ended the narration saying, and for us, and you intended to say, for us who are so ungrateful to those two who have climbed Calvary for us. You were quite right in writing those words. Add them every time I show you one of our sorrows. Let them be like the church bell that rings and calls men to meditate and repent. It is enough now. Rest. May peace be with you. The Poem of the Man God, The First Year of Public Life, Volume 1, Chapter 45, Jesus is Baptized in the Jordan, 3rd of February, 1944, at night. I see a bare, flat country without any villages or vegetation. There are no cultivated fields, but a few odd plants are growing here and there in clusters like vegetable families where the deep soil is less parched. Imagine that the arid wasteland is on my right-hand side, with my back turned to the north, and the harsh area stretches southwards. On my left instead, I can see a river with very low banks, flowing slowly from north to south. The very slow flowing water makes me understand that there are no falls in the level of the riverbed, and that it flows in such a flat country as to form a depression. The movement of the water is just sufficient to avoid the formation of marshes. The river is so shallow that the bottom can be seen. I would say the water is a metre deep, or a metre and a half at most. It is as wide as the River Arno in the St. Miniato and Poti area, about 20 metres. However, I am not good at estimating. And yet its colour is blue with a light green hue near the banks, where on the humid soil there is a strip of thick green vegetation, very pleasant to look at. The sight of the stony, sandy bleakness of the ground tying before it is instead a very monotonous one indeed. The internal voice which I told you I hear and tells me what I must take note of and know is now warning me that I am looking at the Jordan Valley. I am calling it a valley, because that is the name used to indicate the place where a river flows. But here it is incorrect to call it so, because a valley presupposes the presence of mountains, but I do not see any mountains in the neighbourhood. In any case, I am near the Jordan, and the wasteland on my right is the desert of Judah. If it is correct to call a desert a place where there are no houses or man's works. It is not so according to our idea of a desert. There are none of the undulating sands of the desert, as we understand it, but only bare ground strewn with stones and rubble, like alluvial grounds after a flood. There are hills in the distance. And yet, near the Jordan, there is a great peace, something special and unusual as one often feels on the shores of Lake Tresimeno. It is a place which seems to be full of memories of angels, flights and celestial voices. I cannot describe exactly what I feel, but I feel that I am in a place that communicates with my soul. While I am watching these things, I notice that the right bank of the Jordan, in respect to me, is becoming crowded with people. There are many men dressed in different fashions. Some seem ordinary people, some rich, and there are some who appear to be Pharisees, because their tunics are adorned with fringes and braids. In the midst of them, standing on a rock, there is a man whom I recognise at once to be the Baptist, although it is the first time I have seen him. He is speaking to the crowd, and I can assure you that his sermon is not a sweet one. 
Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder. Well then, what should we call this impetuous orator? John the Baptist deserves the names of thunderbolt, avalanche, earthquake. So impetuous and severe he is in his speech and gestures. He is announcing the Messiah and exhorting the people to prepare their hearts for his coming, eradicating all obstructions and rectifying their thoughts. But it is a violent and harsh speech. The precursor does not possess the light hand Jesus used to cure the wounds of hearts. He is a doctor who lays the wound bare, scrutinizes it and cuts it mercilessly. While I am listening, I am not repeating the words because they are related by the evangelists, but here they are amplified in impetuosity. I see my Jesus proceeding along a path, which is at the edge of the grassy shady strip coasting the Jordan. This rustic road, it is more a path than a road, seems to have been opened by the caravans and the people who throughout the years and centuries passed along it to reach a point where it is easy to wade because the water is very shallow. The path continues on the other side of the river and disappears from sight in the green strip of the other bank. Jesus is alone. He is walking slowly, coming forward behind the Baptist. He approaches noiselessly and listens to the thundering voice of the penitent of the desert, as if he also were one of the many who came to John to be baptized and purified for the coming of the Messiah. There is nothing to distinguish Jesus from the others. His clothes are those of common people, but he has the bearing and handsomeness of a gentleman. There is no divine sign discriminating him from the crowd. But it would appear that John perceives a special spirituality emanate from him. He turns round and at once identifies the source of the emanation. He descends impulsively from the rocky pulpit and moves quickly towards Jesus, who has stopped a few yards away from the crowd and is leaning against the trunk of a tree. Jesus and John stare at each other for a moment. Jesus with his very sweet blue eyes, John with his very severe black flashing ones. Seen from nearby, one is the antithesis of the other. They are both tall, they are only resemblance. For all the rest, they differ immensely. Jesus is fair haired. His hair is long and tidy. His face is white ivory, his eyes blue. His garment simple but majestic. John is hairy. His straight black hair falls unevenly onto his shoulders. His sparse dark beard covers his face almost completely. But his cheeks, hollowed by fasting, are still noticeable. His feverish eyes are black. His complexion is dark, tanned by the sun and weather-beaten. His body is covered with hairs. He is half-naked in his camel hair garment, which is tied to his waist by a leather belt and covers his trunk reaching down to his thin sides, whilst his right side is uncovered and bare, completely weatherbeat. They look like a savage and an angel, seen close together. John, after scrutinising him with his piercing eyes, exclaims, Here is the Lamb of God! How is it that my Lord comes to me? Jesus replies calmly, to fulfill the penitential rite. Never, my Lord, I must come to you to be sanctified, and you are coming to me. And Jesus, laying his hand on the head of John, who had bowed down in front of him, replies, Let it be done as I wish, that all justice may be fulfilled, and your right may become the beginning of a higher mystery, and men may be informed that the victim is in the world. John looks at him with his eyes sweetened by tears and precedes Jesus towards the bank of the river. Jesus takes off his mantle and tunic and is left with a kind of pair of short trousers. He then descends into the water where there is John who baptizes him, 
pouring on his head some water from the river by means of a cup tied to his belt. It looks like a shell or a half pumpkin dried and emptied. Jesus is really the lamb. A lamb in the whiteness of his flesh, in the modesty of his gestures, in the meekness of his look. While Jesus climbs onto the bank and after putting on his clothes, concentrates on praying, John points him out to the crowd and testifies that he recognised him by the sign that the Spirit of God had shown him as an infallible means to identify the Redeemer. But I am enraptured in watching Jesus pray, and I can only see his bright figure against the green of the riverbank. Jesus says, John did not need any sign for himself. His soul, which had been pre-sanctified in his mother's womb, possessed that penetration of supernatural intelligence, which all men would have had if Adam had not sinned. If man had persevered in grace, innocence and loyalty to his creator, he would have seen God through external appearance. In Genesis, it is said that God used to speak to the innocent man in an informal way, and that man did not faint hearing his voice, neither was he deceived in discerning it. Such was the destiny of man, to see and understand God exactly as a son does his father. Then man sinned, and he no longer dared to look at God. He was no longer able to see and understand God. And now he is less and less able to do so. But John, my cousin John, had been purified from fault when the full of grace lovingly embraced Elizabeth, who, after being barren, had become pregnant. The little child had leapt out of joy in a womb because he felt the scales of sin falling from his soul as a scab falls off a wound when the tatter is healed. The Holy Spirit, who had made Mary the mother of the Saviour, started his mission of salvation on that child about to be born through Mary, the living tabernacle of incarnate salvation. The child was destined to be united to me, not so much by his blood, as by the mission, by which we were like the lips that express a word. John was the lips, I the word. He was the precursor both in the gospel and in martyrdom. I, by means of my divine perfection, made perfect both the gospel which John had started and martyrdom, suffered to defend the law of God. John did not need any sign, but the sign was necessary for the darkness of spirit of other people. On what would John base his statement? but on an undeniable proof of evident to the eyes and ears of backward and dull listeners. Neither did I need to be baptised, but the wisdom of the Lord had chosen that moment and way of our meeting, and leading John out of his cave in the desert and me from my home, he united us in that hour to open the heavens above me, and he descended himself, a divine dove, on him who was to baptize men with that dove, and his announcement was heard descending from heaven, more powerful than the angels, because it came from my father. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, so that man should have no excuse or doubt in following or not following me. The manifestations of Christ have been numerous, the first, after his birth, was the Magi's. The second was in the temple. The third on the bank of the Jordan. Then there was an endless number of them, which I will let you know, because my miracles are manifestations of my divine nature, down to the last ones, my resurrection and ascension into heaven. My fatherland was full of my manifestations like seeds scattered to the four winds, 
They took place in every social condition and place in life, to shepherds, powerful people, scholars, skeptical men, sinners, priests, rulers, children, soldiers, Jews and Gentiles. And they take place even now, but as in the past, the world does not accept them. It does not accept the present manifestations and forgets the past ones. Well, I will not give up. I will repeat myself to save you and to persuade you to have faith in me. Do you know, Mary, what you are doing? Or rather, what I am doing in showing you the gospel? Making a stronger attempt to bring men to me. You yearned for it with your fervent prayers. I will no longer confine myself to words. They tire men and detach them. It is a fault, but it is so. I will have recourse to visions also of my gospel, and I will explain them to make them more attractive and clear. I give you the comfort of seeing them. I give everybody the possibility of wishing to know me. And if it is of no avail, and like cruel children, they should throw away the gift without understanding its value, you will be left with my present and they with my indignation. I shall be able once again to repeat the old reproach. We played for you and you would not dance. We sang dirges and you would not weep. But it does not matter, let them the inconvertible ones heap burning coals on their heads and let us turn to the little sheep seeking to become acquainted with their shepherd. It is I and you are the staff leading them to me. As you can see, I have hastened to add these details which being trifling matters had escaped my notice and were wanted by you. Today, reading the booklet, I noticed a sentence which may be a guide for you. This morning you were saying that you cannot make my descriptions known because of their style, and since I am terrified at the very thought of being known, I was very happy about it. But do you not think that that is against what the Master says in the last dictation in the booklet? The more careful and precise you are in describing what I see, the greater the number of those who will come to me. This implies that the description must be known. Otherwise, how can there be a number of souls going to Jesus thanks to them? I am drawing your attention to this point. Then you can do what you think is best, because as far as I am concerned, I am indifferent. Nay, humanly speaking, I share your opinion. But in this case, it is not a human matter, and also the human side of the mouthpiece must disappear. Also, in today's dictation, Jesus says, in showing you the gospel, I make a strong attempt to bring men to me. I will no longer confine myself to words. I will have recourse to visions, and I will explain them to make them more attractive and clear. So, in the meantime, as I am a poor non-entity, and by myself I retire to myself, I tell you that your remark has upset me, and the envious one avails himself of the situation. I was so upset that I thought I should no longer describe what I see. But I should write the dictations only. He whispers in my ear, You can see it yourself. Your famous visions serve no purpose whatsoever except to make you pass off as mad. Which you really are. What is that you see? The shams of your agitated mind. It takes much more to deserve to see heaven. He has tortured me all day today with his corrosive temptation. I can assure you that I have not suffered so much because of my bitter physical pain as I suffered and am suffering because of this. He wants to drive me mad. This Friday is a Friday of spiritual temptation for me. I am thinking of Jesus in the desert and of Jesus at Gethsemane. I will not give up as I do not want this cunning demon to laugh, and fighting against him and against my weaker spiritual part. I am writing to you to inform you of my present joy and to assure you 
that as far as I am concerned, I should be quite happy if Jesus deprived me of this gift of seeing, which is my greatest joy, providing he continues to love me and have mercy on me. The Poem of the Man-God The First Year of the Public Life Volume 1, Chapter 46 Jesus is Tempted in the Desert by the Devil 24th of February, 1944 Thursday following Ash Wednesday I see the solitary land which I already saw on my left-hand side in the vision of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan. But I must be some way inside the desert, because I neither see the beautiful blue, slow-flowing river, nor the green strips of vegetation, which coast its banks and are nourished by its waters. There is nothing here but solitude, stones, and such a parched earth that it has become a yellowish dust, raised now and again by the wind in small eddies, which are so hot and dry that they seem to be the breath of a feverish mouth. And they are very troublesome because of the dust penetrating nostrils and throats. There are a very few small thorny bushes, strangely surviving in so much desolation. They look like small forelocks of surviving hair on a bald head. Above, there is a merciless blue sky. Below, arid land. Around, stones and silence. That is what I see as far as nature is concerned. Leaning against a huge piece of overhanging rock, which, because of its shape, forms a kind of a grotto, there is Jesus sitting on a stone that has been taken into the cave. That is how he protects himself from the scorching sun. And my internal advisor informs me that the stone, on which he is now sitting, is also his kneeling stool and pillow, when he takes a few hours' rest, enveloped in his mantle under a starry sky in the chill air of the night. Near him there is the haversack which I saw him take before departing from Nazareth. It is all he has. And from the way it is folded, I realise it has been emptied of the little food Mary had put into it. Jesus is very thin and pale. He is sitting with his elbows resting on his knees, his forearms forward, his hands joined and his fingers interlaced. He is meditating. Now and again he looks up and around, then looks at the sun, almost perpendicular in the blue sky. Now and again, particularly after looking around at the sun, he closes his eyes and leans on the rock sheltering him, as if he were seized by dizziness. I see Satan's ugly face appear. He does not show himself in the features we imagine him, horns, tails, etc. He looks like a Bedouin, enveloped in his robe, and in the large mantle that resembles a domino. He's wearing a turban on his head, and its white flaps fall along his cheeks, down to his shoulders protecting them. Thus only a very small, dark triangle of his face can be seen, with thin, sinuous lips, very black, hollow eyes, full of magnetic flashes. Two eyes that penetrate and read into the bottom of your heart, but in which you can read nothing, or one word only, mystery. The very opposite of Jesus' eyes, also so magnetic and fascinating, which read in your heart, but in which you can also read that in his heart there is love and bounty for you. Jesus' eyes caress your soul. Satan's are like a double dagger that stabs and burns you. He approaches Jesus. Are you alone? Jesus looks at him but does not reply. How did you happen to be here? Did you get lost? Jesus looks at him again and is silent. Ah, if I had water in my flask, I would give you some. 
but I have none myself. My horse died, and I am now going on foot to the ford. I will get a drink there, and I will find someone who will give me some bread. I know the road. Come with me. I'll take you there. Jesus does not even look at him. You are not answering. Do you know that if you stay here, you will die? The wind is already beginning to blow. There will be a storm. Come. Jesus clenches his hands in silent prayer. Ah, it is you then. I have been looking for you for such a long time. And I have been watching you for so long. Since you were baptized, are you calling the eternal? He is far away. You are now on the earth in the midst of men, and I reign over men. And yet, I feel sorry for you, and I want to help you, because you are so good, and you have come to sacrifice yourself for nothing. Men will hate you because of your goodness. They understand nothing but gold, food, and the pleasure. Sacrifice, sorrow, obedience are words more arid for them than the land around us here. They are more arid than this dust. Only snakes can hide here, waiting to bite, and jackals waiting to tear to pieces. Come with me. It is not worthwhile suffering for them. I know them better than you do. Satan has sat down in front of Jesus and he scrutinizes him with his dreadful eyes and smiles at him with his snake-like mouth. Jesus is always silent and is praying mentally. You don't trust me. You are wrong. I am the wisdom of the earth. I can be your teacher and show you how to triumph. See, the important thing is to triumph. Then... Once we have imposed ourselves and we have enchanted the world, then we can take them wherever we want. But first, we must be as they wish us to be. Like them, we must allure them, make them believe that we admire them and follow their thoughts. You are young and handsome. Start with a woman. One must always start from her. I made a mistake inducing her to be disobedient. I should have advised her differently. I would have turned her into a better instrument, and I would have beaten God. I was in a hurry. But you, I will teach you, because one day I looked at you with angelical joy, and the fraction of that love is still left in me. But you must listen to me and make use of my experience. Find yourself a woman. Where you do not succeed, she will. You are the new Adam. You must have your Eve. In any case, how can you understand and heal the diseases of the senses if you do not know what they are? Don't you know that that is where the seed is? From which the tree of greediness and arrogance sprouts? Why do men want to reign? Why do they want to be rich and powerful, to possess women? She is like a lark. She will be attracted only by something sparkling. Gold and power are two sides of the mirror that draw women, and are the causes of evil in the world. Look, in a thousand different crimes, there are at least nine hundred that take root in the lust of possessing a woman, or in the passion of a woman, burning with a desire that man has not yet satisfied, or can no longer satisfy. Go to a woman if you want to know what life is, and only then you will be able to cure and heal the diseases of mankind. Women, you know, are beautiful. There is nothing nicer in the world. Man has brains and strength, but woman, her thought is a perfume, her touch is the caress of flowers, her grace is like wine.
pleasant to drink. Her weakness is like a hank of silk or the curl of a child in a man's hand. Her caress is a strength which is poured over her own strength and inflames it. Sorrow, fatigue, worry are forgotten when we lie near a woman and she is in our arms like a bunch of flowers. But what a fool I am! You are hungry and I'm talking to you of women. Your energy is exhausted. That is why that fragrance of the earth, that flower of creation, the fruit that gifts and excites love seems without any value to you. But look at these stones! How round and smooth they look, gilded by the setting sun. Don't they look like loaves? Since you are the son of God, all you have to say is, I want. And they will become sweet-smelling bread, just like the loaves housewives are now taking out of their ovens for the supper of their families. And these arid acacias, if you only wish so, Will they not be filled with the sweet fruit and dates, as sweet as honey? Eat your fill, son of God. You are the master of the earth. The earth is bowing down to put itself at your feet and appease your hunger. Don't you see that you are turning pale and unsteady at the mention of bread? Poor Jesus, are you so weak that you cannot even work a miracle? Shall I work it for you? I am not your equal, but I can do something. I will do without any strength for a whole year. I will gather it all together, but I want to serve you because you are good, and I always remember that you are my God, even if now I have forfeited calling you so. Oh, help me with your prayers, that I may be quiet. Man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil starts with anger. He grinds his teeth and clenches his fists, but he controls himself and turns his grinding into a smile. I understand. You are above the necessities of the earth and you are disgusted at making use of me. I deserved it. But come then, and see what there is in the house of God. You will see how even priests do not refuse to come to a compromise between the spirit and the flesh. After all, they are men, and not angels. Work a spiritual miracle. I will take you up to the pinnacle of the temple. And you will undergo a transfiguration and become most handsome. You will then call the cohorts of angels and will tell them to form a footrest for your feet with their interlaced wings and to let you down thus into the main yard so that people may see you and remember that God exists. One must show oneself now and again because man's memory is so weak, particularly with regard to spiritual matters, you can imagine how happy the angels will be in forming a protection for your feet and a ladder for you to descend. It is said, you must not put the Lord your God to the test. You understand that your apparition would not change anything and the temple would continue to be a market full of corruption. Your divine wisdom is aware that the hearts of the ministers of the temple are nest survivors that tear and are torn to pieces for the sake of prevailing. They are subdued only by human power. Well then, come, adore me. I will give you the earth, Alexander, Cyrus, Caesar. All the great rulers, past or present, will be like the leaders of miserable caravans as compared with you, as you shall have the kingdoms of the world under your scepter. And with the kingdoms, all the wealth, all the beautiful things on earth, the women, horses, armies, and temples. 
You will be able to raise your sign everywhere when you are the king of kings and the lord of the world. You will then be obeyed and respected both by the people and by the priesthood. All classes will honor and serve you because you will be the powerful one, the only one, the Lord. Adore me for one moment only. Appease this thirst of mine for being worshipped. It ruined me, but it is still left in me, and I am parched by it. The flames of hell are like a fresh morning breeze, as compared to this fierce ardour burning inside me. It is my hell, this thirst. One moment, one moment only, Christ. You are so good. One moment of joy for the eternally tortured one. Let me feel what it is like to be God, and I will be a devoted, obedient servant for all your life and all your enterprises. One instant, one instant only, and I will no longer torture you. And Satan falls on his knees, imploring. Jesus instead stands up. He has lost weight because of the long days of fast. And he now looks taller. His face is terribly severe and potent. His eyes are two burning sapphires. His voice is like thunder. It reverberates in the cave of the huge stone and spreads over the stony, desolate plain when he cries, Be off, Satan! It is written, You must worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Satan, with a cry of fearful torture and indescribable hatred, springs to his feet, a dreadful sight in his furious smoky figure, and it disappears with a last cursing yell. Jesus is tired and sits down, leaning back with his head resting on the stone. He looks exhausted, he's perspiring, but angels come to blow gently with their wings on the closeness of the cave, thus purifying and refreshing the air. Jesus opens his eyes and smiles. I do not see him eat. I would say that he is nourished by the aroma of paradise and is reinvigorated by it. The sun has set in the west. It takes his empty haversack and in the company of the angels who, flying above his head, emit a mild light while it is getting dark very rapidly, he starts walking eastwards, or rather north-eastwards. He has resumed his usual expression. His step is steady. The only remaining sign of his long fast is a more ascetic look on his pale, thin face and in his eyes enraptured in a joy which does not belong to this world. Jesus says, Yesterday you had no strength, which is my will, and you were, therefore, half alive. I let your body rest, and I made you fast, the only way which is burdensome to you, depriving you of my word. Poor Mary, you kept Ash Wednesday, you tasted an ashen flavour in everything because you were without your master. I did not let you perceive me, but I was there. This morning, as our anxiety is reciprocal, when you were half asleep, I whispered to you, Agnus Dei qui tolis peccata mundi, dona nobis pacem, and I made you repeat it many times. And I repeated it to you many times. You thought that I was going to speak about that. No. First, there is the subject which I showed you and upon which I will comment for you. Then this evening I will comment on this other one. As you have seen, kindness is always Satan's disguise when he presents himself. 
he looks like an ordinary person. If souls are careful, and above all, if they are in spiritual contact with God, they perceive the warning that makes them cautious and prepares them to fight the devil's snares. But if souls are distracted, separated from God by an overwhelming sensuality, and are not assisted by prayer, which joins them to God and pours strength into their hearts of men, then they seldom perceive the snares hidden under the innocent appearance, and they fall into the trap. It is then very difficult for them to free themselves. The two most common means adopted by Satan to conquer souls are sensuality and gluttony. He always starts from material things. Once he has dismantled and subdued the material side, he attacks the spiritual part. First, the morals. Thoughts with their pride and greed. Then, the spirit, obliterating not only its love, which no longer exists when man replaces divine love with other human loves, but also the fear of God. Then, man surrenders his body and soul to Satan, only for the sake of enjoying what he wants and enjoying it more and more. You saw how I behaved. Silence and prayer. Silence, because if Satan performs his work of seducer and comes round us, he must put up with the situation without any foolish impatience or cowardly fears. We must react with resolution to his presence and with prayer to his allurements. It is useless to debate with Satan. He would win, because he is strong in his dialectics. Only God can beat him. And so you must have recourse to God, that he may speak for you, through you. You must show Satan that the name and that sign, not so much written on paper or engraved on wood, but written and engraved in your hearts. My name, my sign. You should answer back to Satan using the word of God. Only when he insinuates that he is like God, he cannot bear that. Then after the struggle, there comes victory, and the angels serve and defend the winner from Satan's hatred. They restore him with celestial dews, with the grace that they pour with full hands into the heart of the faithful son, with a blessing that caresses his soul. One must be determined to defeat Satan and have faith in God and in his help, faith in the power of prayer and in the Lord's bounty, then Satan can do no harm. Go in peace. This evening, I will gladden you with the remainder. The Poem of the Man-God The First Year of Public Life Volume 1, Chapter 47 Jesus meets John and James, 25th of February, 1944. I see Jesus walking along the green strip of vegetation that borders the Jordan. He has gone back to the same place where he was baptized. He is near the ford that apparently was well known and commonly used to cross to the other bank towards Perea. But the place, which was so crowded before, is now deserted. There are only a few travellers going on foot or riding donkeys or horses. Jesus does not seem to be aware of them. He proceeds along his way northwards, absorbed in his thoughts. When he reaches the ford, he meets a group of men of different ages who are discussing animatedly. And then they part, some southwards, some northwards. Amongst those going northwards, I see John and James. John is the first to see Jesus, and he points him out to his brother and companions. They talk a little amongst themselves, and then John starts walking quickly to reach Jesus. James follows him, walking a little slower. The others do not show any interest. They walk slowly while discussing. When John is near Jesus, 
about two or three meters behind him. He shouts, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus turns round and looks at him. There are now only a few steps between them. They look at each other. Jesus, with his serious, scrutinizing look. John, with his pure eyes, smiling in his beautiful, youthful face that looks like the face of a girl. He's about 20 years old. And on his rosy cheeks, there is only the sign of a blonde down, like a golden veil. Whom are you looking for? asks Jesus. For you, master. How do you know I am a master? The Baptist told me. Well then, why do you call me Lamb? Because I heard him call you so one day, when you were passing by, just over a month ago. What do you want from me? I want you to tell us words of eternal life and to comfort us. But who are you? I am John of Zebedee, and this is James, my brother. We are from Galilee, and we are fishermen. But we are also disciples of John. He spoke words of life to us, and we listened to him, because we want to follow God and deserve his forgiveness, doing penance, and thus prepare our hearts for the coming of the Messiah. You are the Messiah. John said so, because he saw the sign of the dove descending on you. He said to us, here is the Lamb of God. I say to you, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, give us peace, because we no longer have anyone who may guide us, and our souls are upset. Where is John? Herod has taken him. He is in prison at Machiris. The most faithful amongst his disciples have tried to free him, but it is not possible. We are coming from there. Let us come with you, Master. Show us where you live. Come. But do you know what you are asking for? Who follows me will have to leave everything. His home, his relatives, his way of thinking, also his life. I will make you my disciples and my friends, if you wish so. But I have neither wealth nor protection. I am poor, and I shall be even poorer, to the extent of not having a place where I may rest my head, and I will be persecuted by my enemies, even more than a lost sheep is pursued by wolves. My doctrine is even more rigid than John's, because it forbids also resentment. And my doctrine is concerned not so much with external matters as it is with the soul. You must be reborn if you want to be my disciples. Are you willing to do that? Yes, Master. Only you have the words that can give us light. They descend upon us, and where there was darkness and desolation, because we had no guide, they shed light and sunshine. Come then, let us go. I will teach you on our way. Jesus says, The crowd that met me was a large one, but only one recognized me. He, whose soul, mind and flesh were pure and free, from all lewdness. I insist on the value of purity. Chastity is always the source of clear ideas. Virginity refines and then preserves intellectual and emotional sensitiveness, elevating it to such a perfection that only a virgin can experience. There are many ways of being a virgin. By compulsion, and this applies particularly to women, when no one ever proposed to them. The same should apply to men, but it does not, and that is bad, because only heads of families with unhealthy minds and often disabled bodies can be born of youth soiled with lust before time. There is wanted virginity, 
that is, the virginity of those who consecrate themselves to the Lord with the ardor of their souls, a beautiful virginity, a sacrifice pleasing to God. But they do not all persist in their purity like lilies, which stand upright on their stalks, looking towards heaven, unaware of the mud on the ground, open to the kisses of God's Son and his dews. Many are faithful only in a material way, but they are unfaithful in their thoughts, which regret and wish for what they sacrificed. They are virgins only by heart. If their flesh is intact, their hearts are not. Their hearts ferment, boil, exhale fumes of sensuality. The more refined and reproved, the more it is the invention of a mind that caresses, nourishes, and continually enlarges the images of satisfactions. Illicit even for those who are free, more than illicit for those consecrated to God. Then, you have the hypocrisy of the vow. Its appearance is there, its essence is not. And I tell you that between those who come to me with their lilies broken by the brutality of a tyrant, and those who come with their lilies materially intact, but covered with the slaver of a sensuality they have caressed and cultivated to fill their hours of solitude, I will call virgins the former, and non-virgins, the latter. I will give the former the crown of virgins and the double crown of martyrs because of their flesh, which has been wounded, and of their hearts, which have been ulcerated by a mutilation they did not want. The value of purity is such that, as you have seen, the first thing Satan was anxious about was to deceive me about impurity. He knows very well that sensual sins dismantle the soul and make it an easy prey to other sins. Satan's efforts aimed at the capital point in order to defeat me. Bread, hunger are the material forms of the allegory of appetite, of the appetites that Satan takes advantage of for his own purpose. The food he offered me to make me fall intoxicated at his feet is quite a different thing. Greed would have followed, then avarice, power, idolatry, blasphemy, and the abjuration of the divine law. But that was the first step to catch me, exactly as he did to injure Adam. The world sneers at pure people. Those who are guilty of lewdness strike them. John the Baptist is the victim of the lust of an obscene couple. But if there is still some light in the world, this is due to the pure of the world. They are the servants of God. They understand God and repeat God's words. I say, happy the pure in heart, they shall see God. Also in this world, since the fumes of sensuality do not perturb their hearts, they see God. They hear him, they follow him, and they show him to other people. John of Zebedee is a pure soul. He is the pure one amongst my disciples, a soul as beautiful as a flower in an angelical body. He calls me with the words of his first master and asks me to give him peace, but he already has peace in his heart because of his purity. And I loved him because of his purity, to which I entrusted my teachings, my secrets, and the most dear creature I had. He was my first disciple, who loved me from the very first instant he saw me. His soul had melted with mine from the day he saw me passing near the Jordan, and he saw the Baptist pointing to me. Even if he had not found me later, when I came back from the desert, he would have looked for me until he found me. Because who is pure is humble and anxious to be taught in the science of God. And like the water that flows to the sea, he goes towards those he knows to be masters 
in the celestial doctrine. Jesus says also, I did not want you to speak about the sensual temptation of your Jesus, even if your internal voice had made you understand Satan's motive in attracting me towards sensuality. I preferred to speak of it myself. Think no more about it. It was necessary to mention it. Go on now. Leave Satan's flower on its sands. Follow Jesus as John did. You will be walking among thorns, but as roses, you will find the drops of blood of him who shed them for you to defeat the flesh also in you. I will forestall a remark as well. In his gospel, John mentioning his meeting with me says, and the following day. It would therefore appear that the Baptist pointed me out the day after my baptism and that John and James followed me at once. But that conflicts with what other evangelists said about the 40 days spent in the desert. But you should read as follows. John having already been arrested, one day later, the two disciples of John the Baptist, the ones to whom he had pointed me out, saying, Here is the Lamb of God, on seeing me again, called me and followed me, after I had come back from the desert. And we went back together to the shores of the Lake of Galilee, where I had taken shelter to begin evangelizing from there. And the two, after being with me during the whole journey, and then for one day in the hospitable house of a friend of my relatives, spoke to me, to the other fishermen. But it was the initiative of John, whose will to do penance had made his soul already so limpid, owing to his purity, a masterpiece of pellucidity, in which the truth was clearly reflected, bestowing on him also the holy daring of the pure and generous, who are never afraid of stepping forward, wherever they see that there is God, and truth and doctrine and the way of God. How much I loved him for that simple, heroic feature of his. The poem of the man God, the first year of the public life. Volume 1, Chapter 48, John and James Speak to Peter About the Messiah 12th of October, 1944 A most clear dawn over the Lake of Galilee. The sky and the water sparkle with rosy flashes, not very different from the mild ones shining on the walls of the little orchards of the lake village, where fruit trees with their unkempt, luxuriant foliage, seem to rise from the orchards and peep at the little lanes bending over them. The village is beginning to awaken. Women start going to the fountain or to the washing place, while fishermen unload the baskets of fish or haggle over prizes in very loud voices, with merchants who have come from other villages, while others carry the fish to their houses. I called it a village, but it is not a very small one. It is rather a modest place, at least what I see of it, but it is quite large and spreads generally along the lake. John comes out of a little street and goes quickly towards the lake. James follows him, but much more calmly. John looks at the boats which are already on the shore, but cannot see the one he is looking for. He sees it while it is still about 100 yards from the beach, manoeuvring to enter the harbour, and holding his hands at the side of his mouth, he shouts at the top of his voice, a long, oh which must be their usual call. When he sees that they have heard him, he gesticulates with both his arms, obviously meaning, come, come. The men in the boat, not knowing what is the matter, lay on the oars, and the boat moves faster than it did with the sail, which they have struck, probably to gain time. When they are about ten metres from the shore, John does not wait any longer. 
he takes off his mantle and his long tunic and throws them on the shore, takes off his sandals, lifts its under tunic and holds it with one hand almost against his groin, and goes into the water to meet the boat arriving. Why did you two not come? asks Andrew. Peter sulkily does not say one word. And why did you not come with me and James? John replies to Andrew. I went fishing. I have no time to waste. You disappeared with that man. I beckoned you to come. It is him. You should hear his words. We stayed with him all day until late at night. We have now come to say to you, come. Is it really him? Are you sure? We only saw him then when the Baptist pointed him out to us. It is him. He did not deny it. Anyone can say what suits him to impose himself on dupes. It is not the first time, mumbles Peter, dissatisfied. Oh, Simon, don't say that. He is the Messiah. He knows everything. He hears you. John is grieved and dismayed at Simon Peter's words. Sure, the Messiah. And he showed himself to you, James and Andrew, three poor ignorant fishermen. The Messiah will need much more than that. And he hears me, eh, my poor boy. The first sunshine of spring has damaged your brains. Come on, come on, do some work. That's much better. And forget such fairy tales. I'm telling you, he is the Messiah. John said holy things, but he speaks of God. Who is not Christ cannot speak such words. Simon, I'm not a boy. I am old enough and I am composed and thoughtful. You know that. I did not speak much, but I listened a lot during the hours we spent with the Lamb of God. And I can tell you that, really, he can but be the Messiah. Why don't you believe? Why do you not want to believe? You may not believe because you have not heard him, but I believe him. We are poor and ignorant? Well, he says that he has come to announce the gospel of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of peace to the poor, humble, and little ones before the great ones. He said, the great ones already have their delights. They are not enviable delights when compared with the ones I have come to bring you. The great ones are already capable of understanding my means of their culture. But I have come to the little ones of Israel and of the world, to those who weep and hope, to those who seek light and are hungry for the real manner, to whom learned men do not give light and food, but only burdens, darkness, chains, contempt. And I call the little ones. I have come to turn the world upside down, because I will lower what is now held high, and I will raise what is now held in contempt. Let those who want the truth and peace, who want eternal life, come to me. Those who love light, let them come to me. I am the light of the world. Did he not say that, John? James has spoken in a calm, gentle voice. Yes, and, he said, the world will not love me. The great world will not love me, because it is corrupted by vices and idolatry. Nay, the world will not want me, because as it is the offspring of darkness, it does not love the light. But the earth is not made only of the great world. There are on it. Also those who, mixed with the world, are not of the world. There are people who are of the world because they have been imprisoned in it, like fish in a net. He said exactly that, because we were speaking on the shore of the lake and he was pointing to some nets which were being dragged to the shore with fish in them. Nay, he said, see, none of those fish wanted to be caught in the net. Also men, intentionally, would not like to fall prey to mammon. Not even the most wicked, who, blinded by pride, do not believe they have no right to do what they do. Their real sin is pride, 
all the other sins grow from it. Those who are not completely wicked would like even less to fall prey to mammon. But they fall because of their frivolity and because of a weight that drags them to the bottom and which is Adam's sin. I have come to remove that sin and while awaiting the hour of redemption to give those who believe in me a strength such that will enable them to free themselves from the snares that trap them and will make them free to follow me, the light of the world. Well then, if he said that, we must go to him at once. Peter, with his impulsiveness, which is so genuine and I like so much, has decided at once and is already acting accordingly, hastening to unload the boat which has already reached the shore. The fishermen have almost beached it, unloading nets, ropes and sails. And you, silly Andrew, why did you not go with them? But Simon, you reproached me because I did not persuade them to come with me. You have been grumbling all night, and now you rebuke me because I did not go? You are right, but I did not see him. You did, and you must have seen that he is not like us. He must have something compelling. Oh, yes, John says. His face, his eyes. What beautiful eyes, aren't they, James? And his voice. Oh, what a voice. When he speaks, you seem to be dreaming of heaven. Quick, quick, let's go and see him. And you, addressing the other fisherman, Take everything to Zebedee and tell him to do as he thinks best. We'll be back this evening in time to go fishing. They all get dressed and set out. But Peter, after a few yards, stops and gets hold of John's arm and asks him, Did you say that he knows everything and hears everything? Yes, I did. Just think that when we saw the moon high up in the sky, I said, I wonder what Simon will be doing now. And he said, he's casting his net, and he cannot set his mind at rest, because he has to do it all by himself, since you did not go out with the twin boat in such a good evening for fishing. He does not know that before long he will be fishing with different nets and catching different fish. Holy mercy, it's true! Well, he will also have heard, also that I called him, Little less than a liar. I can't go to him. Oh, Simon, he's so good. He certainly knows what you thought. He already knew. Because when we left him, saying that we were coming to you, he said, Go, but don't let the first words of contempt discourage you. Who wants to come with me must be able to make headway against the sneering words of the world and the prohibitions of relatives. Because I am above blood and society, and I triumph over them. And who is with me will also triumph forever. And he also said, don't be afraid to speak. The man who hears will come, because he is a man of goodwill. Is that what he said? Well, I'll come. Speak, speak of him while we're going. Where is he? In a poor house. They must be his friends. Is he poor? A workman from Nazareth, so he said. And how does he live now, if he does not work any longer? We did not ask him. Perhaps his relatives help him. It would have been better if he had brought some fish, some bread and fruit, something. We are going to consult a rabbi, because he is like he's, he's more than a rabbi, and we are going empty-handed. Our rabbis don't like that. But he does. We had but twenty pennies between us, James and I, and we offered him them, as is customary with rabbis. He did not want them. But since we insisted so much, he said, May God reward you with the blessings of the poor. Come with me. And he gave them to some poor people. He knew where they lived. And when we asked him, Master, are you not keeping anything for yourself? He replied, The joy of doing the will of God and serving his glory. 
we also said, you're calling us master. But we are all poor. What shall we bring you? He replied with a smile, which made us enjoy the delights of paradise. I want a great treasure from you. And we said, but we have nothing. And he answered, a treasure with seven names, which even the poorest may have, while the rich may not possess it. You have it, and I want it. Listen to the names. Charity, faith, goodwill, right intention, continence, sincerity, spirit of sacrifice. That is what I want from my followers, only that, and you have it. It is dormant, like a seed under a cold cod, but the spring sunshine will make it sprout into a sevenfold spike. That is what he said. Ah, oh, now I feel that he is the true Rabboni, the promised Messiah. He is not harsh with the poor. He does not ask for money. It is enough to call him the holy man of God. We can go safely. And it all ends. The Poem of the Man-God The First Year of the Public Life Volume 1, Chapter 49, First Meeting of Peter and the Messiah, 13th of October, 1944. With my soul dejected by too many things, I am praying to receive illumination, and I am led to Chapter 12 of the Epistle to the Hebrews, and the strength of my spirit is really reinvigorated, and once again I have the energy to listen. In fact, when I am oppressed by so many things, I feel like saying, I do not want to do anything anymore. An ordinary life, an ordinary life at all costs. But I know who it is who speaks, and I see him look at me with loving, beseeching eyes, and I can no longer say I do not. God is really a fire which devours also the inclinations of our human nature when the latter yields to him, to him who speaks, saying, I will not leave you, I will not abandon you. I want to repeat once again with full confidence, you are of much help to me. I do not fear man, O oh God. Do not disappoint my hope. At 2 p.m. I see the following. Jesus is coming along a little road, a path between two fields. He is alone. John is moving towards him along a different path in the fields, and he meets him at last, going through an opening in a hedge. John, both in yesterday's vision and today's, is very young. His face is rosy and beardless, the fair complexion of a youth who can hardly be called a man. There are no signs of moustache or beard, but only the smoothness of his rosy cheeks, his red lips, and his bright smile and pure look, not so much because of its deep turquoise hue as because of the limpidity of his virginal soul shining through his eyes. His blonde, brown, long, soft hair undulates at each step while he walks almost as fast as if he were running. When he is about to pass through the hedge, he shouts, Master! Jesus stops and turns round, smiling. Master, I have longed so much for you. The people in the house where you live told me that you were to come towards the country, but they did not say where. I was afraid I might not meet you. While speaking, John has bent his head slightly out of respect, and yet he is full of truthful love, both in his attitude and in his eyes, which he raises toward Jesus, while his head is still gently inclined towards his shoulder. I saw you were looking for me, and I came towards you. You saw me? Where were you, Master? Over there. And Jesus points to a group of trees far away, 
which, by the colour of their foliage, I would say were olive trees. I was over there, I was praying, and thinking what to say this evening in the synagogue. But I came away as soon as I saw you. But how could you see me? If I can hardly see the place hidden as it is behind that hedge. And yet, you see, here I am. I came to meet you because I saw you. What the eye does not do, love does. Yes, love does. You love me, therefore, master? And do you love me, John, son of Zebedee? So much, master. I think I have always loved you, before meeting you, long before my soul was looking for you. And when I saw you, my soul said to me, Here is the one you are seeking. I think I met you because my soul perceived you. You said it, John, and what you say is right. I also came towards you because my soul perceived. For how long will you love me? Forever, master. I no longer want to love anybody but to you. You have a father and a mother, brothers and sisters. You have your life, and with your life you have a woman and love. How will you be able to leave all that for my sake? Master, I do not know, but I think... If it is not pride to say so, that your fondness will take the place of father and mother, of brothers and sisters, and also of a woman. I will be compensated for everything if you love me. And if my love should cause you sorrows and persecutions, they will be nothing if you love me. And the day I should die... No, you are young, master. Why die? Because the Messiah has come to preach the law in its truthfulness and to accomplish redemption. And the world loathes the law and does not want redemption. Therefore they persecute God's messengers. Oh, let that never be. Do not mention that prediction of death to him who loves you. But if you should die, I would still love you. Allow me to love you. John's look is an imploring one. He has bowed his head lower than ever, and he walks beside Jesus and seems to be begging love. Jesus stops. He looks at him, scrutinizes him with his deep, penetrating eyes, and then lays his hand on his bowed head. I want you to love me. Oh, master! John is happy. Although his eyes shine with tears, his well-shaped young mouth smiles. He takes the divine hand, kisses it on its back, and presses it to his heart. They take to the road again. You said you were looking for me. Yes, to tell you that my friends want to meet you. And because, oh, how I was longing to be with you again. I left you only a few hours ago, but I could no longer be without you. Have you therefore been a good announcer of the word? Also, James, master, spoke of you in such a way as to convince them. So that also he who has no confidence, and is not to be blamed because he reserved was due to prudence, is now convinced. Let us go and give him full assurance. He was somewhat afraid. No, not afraid of me. I have come for good people and even more for those who stand in error. I want to save people, not to condemn them. I will be full of mercy with honest people. And with sinners? Also, by dishonest people, I mean those who are spiritually dishonest and hypocritically they feign to be good, whereas they do ill deeds. And they do such things, and in such a way for their own profit, and to secure an advantage over their neighbours, I will be severe with them. Oh, Simon, then need not worry, he is as loyal as no one else. 
That is what I like, and I want you all to be so. Simon wants to tell you many things. I will listen to him after speaking in the synagogue. I ask them to inform the poor and sick people in addition to the rich and healthy ones. They are all in need of the gospel. They are near the village. Some children are playing in the road and one of them runs into Jesus' legs and would have fallen if he were not quick in getting hold of him. The child cries just the same as if he had been hurt, and Jesus, holding him in his arms, says, An Israelite who is crying? What should the thousands of children have done who became men crossing the desert with Moses? And yet the Most High Lord sent the sweet manna for them, rather than for the others, because he loves innocent children and looks after these little angels of the earth, these wingless little birds, just as he sees to the sparrows of woods and towns. Do you like honey? Yes. Well, if you are good, you will eat a honey which is sweeter than the honey of your bees. Where? When? When after a life of loyalty to God, you will go to him. I know that I cannot go there unless the Messiah comes. My mother says that now we in Israel are like many Moses and we died seeing the promised land. She says that we are there waiting to go in and that only the Messiah will make us go in. What a clever little Israelite. Well, I tell you that when you die, you will go to paradise at once because the Messiah will already have opened the gates of heaven. But you must be good. Mommy, mommy! The child slides down from Jesus' arms and runs towards a young woman who is entering her house holding a cop amphora. Mommy, the new rabbi told me that I will go to paradise at once when I die and I will eat so much honey if I am good. I will be good. God grant it. I am sorry, Master, if he troubled you. He's so lively. Innocence does not trouble, woman. May God bless you, because you are a mother who is bringing her children up in the knowledge of the law. The woman blushes at being praised and replies, May the blessing of the Lord be with you too. And she disappears with her little one. Do you like the children, Master? Yes, I do because they are pure, sincere, and affectionate. Have you any nephews, Master? I have but my mother. In her there is purity, sincerity, the love of the most holy children, together with wisdom, justice, and for the fortitude of adults. I have everything in my mother, John. And you left her. God is above all, so the holiest mother. Will I meet her? Yes, you will. And will she love me? She will love you because she loves whoever loves her Jesus. Then you have no brothers? I have some cousins on my mother's husband's side. But every man is my brother and I have come for everybody. We are now at the synagogue. I'm going in and you will join me with your friends. John goes away and Jesus goes into a square room with the usual display of triangular lamps and lecterns with rows of parchment. There is already a crowd waiting and praying. Jesus also prays. The people whisper and make their comments behind him as he bows to the head of the synagogue, greeting him, and he asks for a roll at random. Jesus begins his lesson. He says, the Spirit makes me read the following things for you. At chapter 7 of the book of Jeremiah, we read, Yahweh Sabbath, the God of Israel, says this, Amend your behaviour and your actions, and I will stay with you here in this place. Put no trust in delusive words like these. This is the sanctuary of Yahweh, the sanctuary of Yahweh, the sanctuary of Yahweh. But if you do amend your behaviour and your actions, if you treat each other fairly, if you do not exploit the stranger, the orphan and the widow, if you do not shed innocent blood in this place, 
and if you do not follow alien gods to your own ruin, then here in this place I will stay with you in the land that long ago I gave to your fathers forever. Listen, Israel, here I am to illuminate you for the words of light, which your dimmed souls can no longer see or understand. Listen, there is much weeping in the land of the people of God. Old people cry, remembering past glories. Adults cry because they are bent under the yoke. Children cry because they have no prospects of future glory. But the glory of the earth is nothing compared to a glory which no oppressor except mammon and ill will can take away. Why are you crying? Because the Most High, who was always good to his people, has now turned his face elsewhere and no longer allows his children to see his countenance? Is he no longer the God who parted the sea and made Israel cross it and led the people through the desert and nourished them? and defended them from their enemies, and that they might not lose the way to heaven. He gave a law for their souls, as he had sent them a cloud for their bodies. Is he no longer the God that sweetened the waters and sent manna to his worn-out children? Is he not the God who wanted you to settle in his land and made an alliance with you as father with his children? Well, then. Why has the foreigner struck you? Many amongst you mumble, and yet the temple is here. It is not enough to have the temple and go and pray God in it. The first temple is in the heart of every man, and that is where holy prayers should be said. But a prayer cannot be holy unless the heart first amends its way of living, and with his heart, man also amends his habits, affections, the rules of justice towards the poor, servants, relatives, and God. Now look, I see rich, hard-hearted men who make rich offerings to the temple, but they never say to a poor man, Brother, here is a piece of bread and a penny. Take them from man to man and let not my help discourage you as my offering may not make me proud. I see people who, in their prayers, complain to God because he does not hear their prayers promptly. Then, when a poor wretch, very often a relative, says to them, Listen to me, they reply heartlessly, No. I see you crying because your money is squeezed out of your purses by your ruler. But then you squeeze blood out of those you hate. And you are not filled with horror when you take the blood and life away from a body. O oh, Israel, the time of redemption has come. Prepare its way in your hearts with goodwill. Be honest, good, love one another. The rich must not despise the poor. Merchants must not defraud. The poor must not envy the rich. You are all of one blood and you all belong to one God. You are all called to one destiny. Do not shut with your sins the heavens that the Messiah will open for you. Have you erred so far? Err uh, no longer. Abandon all errors. The law is simple, easy and good, as it goes back to the original Ten Commandments, illuminated by the light of love. Come, I will show you which they are. Love, love, love. God's love for you. Your love for God. Love for your neighbours. Always love, because God is love, and those are the Father's children who know how to live love. I am here for everybody, and to give everybody the light of God, 
Here is the word of the Father that becomes food for you. Come, taste. Change the blood of your spirits with this food. Let every poison vanish. Let every lust die. A new glory is offered to you, the Eternal One, to which all those will come to whose hearts will truly study the law of God. Start from love. There is nothing greater. When you know how to love, you will already know everything, and God will love you. And God's love means help against all temptations. May the blessing of God be on those who turn to God with their hearts full of goodwill. Jesus is silent. The people whisper. The meeting breaks up after some hymns, many of which are sung like psalms. Jesus goes out into the little square. On the doorstep there are John and James with Peter and Andrew. Peace to you says Jesus, and he adds, Here is the man who, in order to be just, must not judge before knowing, but he is honest in admitting he is wrong. Simon, you wanted to see me? Here I am. And you, Andrew, why did you not come before? The two brothers look at each other, embarrassed. Andrew whispers, I did not dare. Peter blushes but does not speak. But when he hears Jesus say to his brother, were you doing any wrong in coming? One must not dare do only evil things. He intervenes frankly. It was my fault. He wanted to bring me to you at once. But, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I said, yes, I said, I don't believe it. And I did not want to come. Oh, I feel better now. Jesus smiles. Then he says, And because of your sincerity, I tell you that I love you. But I, I am not good. I am not capable of doing what you said in the synagogue. I am quick-tempered, and if anyone offends me, eh, I am greedy and I like money. And in my fish business, eh, not always, I have not always been honest, and I am ignorant. And I have little time to follow you to receive your light. What shall I do? I would like to become, as you say, but... It is not difficult, Simon. Are you acquainted a little with the scriptures? Are you? Well, think of the prophet Micah. God wants from you what Micah said. He does not ask you to tear your heart apart. Neither does he ask you to sacrifice your most holy affections. He does not ask you for the time being. One day, without being requested by God, you will give God your own self. But he will wait while the sun and the dew turn you, a thin blade of grass as you are now, into a sturdy, glorious palm tree. For the time being, he asks you only this, to be just to love mercy, to take the greatest care in following your God. Strive to do that, and Simon's past will be cancelled, and you will become a new man, the friend of God and of his Christ, no longer Simon, but Cephas, the safe rock on which I lean. I like that. I understand that. The law is so, is so... That is, I cannot comply with it any longer, as the rabbis have made it. But what you say, yes, I think I will be able to do it. And you will help me. Are you staying in this house? I know the owner. I am staying here, but I am going to Jerusalem, and after I will preach throughout Palestine. I came for that, but I will often be here. I will come to hear you again. I want to be your disciple. A little of the light will enter my head. Your heart, above all, Simon. Your heart. And you, Andrew, have you nothing to say? I am listening, Master. My brother is shy. He will become a lion. It is getting dark. May God bless you 
and grant you a good all. Go now. Peace be with you. They go away. As soon as they are out, Peter says, I wonder what he meant before when he said that I would be fishing with other nets and catching different fish. Why did you not ask him? You wanted to say so many things, but you hardly spoke. I, I was bashful. He's so different from all the other rabbis. Now, he's going to Jerusalem, says John, with so much longing and nostalgia. I wanted to ask him if he would let me go with him, but I did not dare. Go and ask him now, my boy, says Peter. We left him so, without a word of affection. Let him at least know that we admire him. I will tell your father. Shall I go, James? Go. John runs away, and he runs back, overjoyed. I said to him, Do you want me to come to Jerusalem with you? He replied, Come, my friend. Friend, he said, tomorrow. I will be here at this time. Ah, oh, to Jerusalem with him. The vision ends. With regard to the previous vision, this morning, the 14th of October, Jesus says to me, I want you and everybody to consider John's behaviour, particularly one point that always escapes everybody's notice. You admire him because he was pure, loving and faithful. But you do not notice that he was great also in humility. He, the first one responsible for Peter's coming to me, was modestly silent about that detail. The apostle of Peter, and consequently the first of my apostles, was John. First in recognizing me, first in speaking to me, in following me, in preaching me. And yet see what he says. Andrew, Simon's brother, was one of the two who had heard John's words and had followed Jesus. The first person he met was his brother Simon, to whom he said, we have found the Messiah, and it took him to Jesus. Besides being good, he is just, and since he knows that Andrew is distressed because of his shy and reserved disposition, and that he would like to do so much, but does not succeed in doing it, he wants the acknowledgement of Andrew's goodwill to be handed down to posterity. He wants Andrew to appear as Christ's first apostle with Peter, notwithstanding that Andrew's shyness and uneasiness with his brother have been the cause of the failure of his apostolate. Amongst those who do something for me, who can imitate John, instead of proclaiming himself an unexcelled apostle, without considering that his success depends on a multitude of things, which are not only holiness, but also human daring, luck, and the occasional chance of being with other people less daring and less lucky, but perhaps holier. When you succeed in doing some good, do not boast about it, as if the merit was entirely yours, Praise God, the Lord of the apostolic workers, and have a clear eye and a sincere heart to see and give each the praise they deserve. A clear eye to descry the apostles who sacrifice themselves and are the first real incentive for the work of the others. Only God sees them. They are timid and seem to be doing nothing whereas they draw from heaven the fire that urges daring workers. A sincere heart in saying, I work, but this fellow loves more than I do. He prays better than I do. I am not able to sacrifice myself as he does, and as Jesus did. In your private room with the door closed, pray secretly since I am aware of his humble, holy virtue, I want to make it known and say, I am an active instrument 
He is a power that inspires me, because joined as he is to God, he is a channel of celestial energy for me. And the blessing of the Father that descends to reward the humble man who secretly sacrificed himself to give strength to the apostles will descend also on the apostle who sincerely acknowledges both the supernatural and silent help of the humble one and his merits which superficial men do not notice. It is a lesson for everybody. Is he my favorite? Yes, he is. Does he not resemble me also in this? Pure, loving, obedient, but also humble. I looked at myself in him as in a mirror, and I could see my virtues in him. I therefore loved him like another self. I could see in him the glance of my father, who considered him a little Christ. And my mother would say to me, I feel as if he were my second son. I seem to be seeing you reproduced in a man. Oh, how well the one full of wisdom knows you, my beloved. The two blues of your pure hearts mingled into one veil, only to form a protection of love for me. And they became one love only, even before I gave my mother to John, and John to my mother. They loved each other, because they realized they were alike, children and brothers of the Father and of the Son. The Poem of the Man-God The First Year of the Public Life Volume 1, Chapter 50 Jesus at Bethsaida in Peter's house He meets Philip and Nathaniel 15th of October, 1944 Later on, at 9.30 I had to describe this John knocks at the door of the house where Jesus is a guest. A woman comes to the door, and when she sees who it is, she calls Jesus. They greet each other with a salutation of peace. Then Jesus says, You have come early, John. I have come to tell you that Peter asks you to pass by Bethsaida. He has spoken to many people about you. We did not go out fishing last night. We prayed as well as we could, and we gave up profit, because the Sabbath was not yet over, and this morning we went through the streets speaking about you. There are many people who would like to hear you. Will you come, Master? I will, although I must go to Nazareth before going to Jerusalem. Peter will take you from the Bethsaida to Tiberias in his boat. It will be even quicker for you. Let us go, then. Jesus takes his mantle and haversack, but John relieves him of the latter, and they set out after saying goodbye to the landlady. The vision shows them coming out of the village and starting their journey to Bethsaida, but I do not hear what they are saying. In fact, the vision is interrupted, and it had resumed only when they are entering Bethsaida. I realize that it is that town because I see Peter Andrew and James with their wives, awaiting Jesus at the entrance to the village. Peace be with you. Here I am. We thank you, Master, also on behalf of those who are waiting for you. It is not of the Sabbath today, but will you speak your words to those waiting to hear you? Yes, Peter, I will, in your house. Peter is overjoyed. Come then! This is my wife, and this is John's mother, and these are their friends. But there are other people waiting for you, relations and friends of ours. Tell them that I will speak to them this evening, before I leave. 
I forgot to mention that they left Capernaum at sunset and arrived at Bethsaida the following morning. Master, please, stay one night at my house. The road to Jerusalem is a long one, even if I will shorten it for you, taking you to Tiberias by boat. My house is poor, but honest and friendly. Stay with us tonight. Jesus looks at Peter and at all the rest who are waiting. He looks at them inquisitively. He then smiles and says, Yes, I will stay. It is a great joy for Peter. People look out from their doors and exchange knowing glances with one another. A man calls James by his name and speaks to him in a low voice, pointing to Jesus. James nods in assent, and the man goes and speaks to other people standing at the crossroads. They go into Peter's house. There is a large, smoky kitchen. In a corner, there are nets, ropes, fishing baskets. In the middle, there is a long, low fireplace, but there is no fire. Through two opposite doors, one can see the street on one side and the kitchen garden with a fig tree and vines on the other side. Beyond the street, the rippling on the sky-blue lake can be seen, and beyond the kitchen garden there is the dark, low wall of another house. I offer you what I have, master, and the best as I know how to. You could not offer any more or any better, because you are making your offering with love. They give Jesus some water to refresh himself, and then some bread and olives, Jesus takes a few mouthfuls only to please them. Then he thanks them and eats no more. Some children look in inquisitively from the kitchen garden and the street. I do not know whether they are Peter's children. I only know that he frowns at the intruders to keep them out. Jesus smiles and says, leave them alone. Master, do you want rest? My room is here and Andrew's is over there. Take your choice. We will not make any noise while you're resting. Have you got a terrace? Yes, and the vine, although it is still almost bare, gives a little shade. Then take me up there. I prefer to rest there. I will think and pray. As you wish, come. A little staircase rises from the kitchen garden up to the roof, which is a terrace surrounded by a low wall. Also there, there are nets and ropes. But how much bright light and what a beautiful view of the blue lake. Jesus sits on a stool, leaning his back against a little wall. Peter bustles with the sail, which he spreads over on the side of the vine to make a shield against the sun. There is a breeze and silence. Jesus is visibly happy. I'm going, Master. Go. Go with John and tell people that I will be speaking here at sunset. Jesus remains alone and prays for a long time. With the exception of two pairs of doves that come and go from their nests and the twittering of sparrows, there is no noise or living being near Jesus praying. The hours pass peacefully and quietly. Then Jesus stands up. He walks around the terrace, looks at the lake, smiles at some children playing in the street and they smile back at him. He looks along the street towards a little square about 100 yards away from Peter's house. He goes downstairs. He looks into the kitchen. Woman, I am going for a walk on the shore. He goes out and walks to the beach near the children. He asks them, what are you doing? We wanted to play at war, but he does not want to, and we are playing at fishing. The boy who does not want to play at war is a frail little fellow with a most bright face. Perhaps he is aware that, as frail as he is, he would get a beating in making war, and so he pleads for peace. But Jesus takes the opportunity to speak to the children. He is right. War is a punishment of God to chastise men, and it is a sign that man is no longer a true son of God. When the Most High created the world, 
He made all things: the sun, the sea, the stars, the rivers, the plants, the animals. But he did not make arms. He created man and gave him his eyes, that he might cast loving glances, and a mouth to utter loving words. And ears to listen to such words, and hands to give help and to caress, and feet to run fast to assist our neighbors in need, and a heart capable of loving. He gave man intelligence, speech, affections, and taste. But he did not give man hatred. Why? Because man, a creature of God, was to be love, as God. Is love. If man had remained a creature of God, he would have persevered in love, and the human family would have not known either war or death. But he does not want to make war because he always loses. I had guessed right. Jesus smiles and says, "We must not reprove what is harmful to us simply because it is harmful to us." We must reprove a thing when it is harmful to everybody. If a person says, "I do not want that because I would lose," that person is selfish. Instead, the good child of God says, "Brothers, I know I would win, but I say to you, don't let us do that, because you would suffer a loss." Oh, that fellow has understood the main precept. Who can tell me which is the main precept? The eleven mouths say all together, "You shall love your God with all your strength and your neighbors as yourself." Oh, you are clever children! Do you all go to school? Yes, we do. Who is the most clever? Him. It is the frail little fellow who does not want war. What is your name? Joel, what a great name! He says, "Let the weakling say, 'I am strong,' but strong in what? In the law of the true God, to be amongst those whom, in the valley of decision, He will judge to be His saints. But the judgment is already near, not in the valley of decision, but on the mountain of redemption." There, the sun and the moon will grow dark with horror, the stars will tremble and shed tears of mercy, and the children of light will be judged and separated from the children of darkness, and the whole of Israel will know that its God has come. Happy those who will have recognized Him. Honey, milk, and fresh water will descend into their hearts, and thorns will become eternal roses. Which of you wants to be amongst those who will be judged saints of God? I, I, I. Would you love the Messiah then? Yes, yes, yes. You, it's you we love. We know who you are. Simon and James have told us, and our mothers have told us. Take us with you. Yes, I will take you if you are good. No more bad words. No more arrogance, quarrels. No answering back to your parents. Prayer. Study, work, obedience, and I will love you and come with you. The children are all round Jesus. They look like a gaily coloured corolla round a long, deep blue pistol. An elderly man goes near the group inquisitively. Jesus turns round to caress a child who is pulling his mantle and sees him. He stares at him intensely. The man blushes and greets him, but does not say anything else. Come, follow me. Yes, master. Jesus blesses the children, and walking beside Philip, he calls him by his name. He goes back home. They sit in the little kitchen garden. Do you want to be my disciple? Yes, I do. But I dare not hope for so much. I have called you. Then I am your disciple. Here I am. Did you know about me? Andrew spoke to me about you. He said to me, 
the one you were pining after has come, because Andrew knew that I yearned for the Messiah. Your expectation has not been disappointed. He is in front of you. My master and my God. You are a well-intentioned Israelite. That is why I am manifesting myself to you. Another friend of yours is waiting. He is a sincere Israelite too. Go and say to him, We have found Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph of the house of David, him of whom Moses and the prophets have spoken. Go. Jesus remains alone until Philip comes back with Nathaniel Bartholomew. Here is a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Peace be with you, Nathaniel. How do you know me? Before Philip called to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Master, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Because I said I saw you while you were meditating under the fig tree, you believe? You will see greater things than that. I solemnly tell you that heaven is open, and because of your faith you will see angels descending and ascending above the Son of Man, that is, above me, who am speaking to you. Master, I am not worthy of such a favour. Believe in me, and you will be worthy of heaven. Will you believe? I will, Master. The vision is interrupted. It starts again on the terrace full of people. Other people are in Peter's kitchen garden. Jesus starts speaking. Peace to men of goodwill. Peace and blessings to their homes, their women, their children. May the grace and the light of God reign in your homes and in the hearts dwelling in them. You have wished to hear me. The word is speaking. It speaks with joy to the honest, with sorrow to the dishonest, with delight to the holy and the pure, with mercy to sinners. It does not deny itself. It has come to spread out like a river that flows to irrigate lands needing water, refreshing them and fertilizing them at the same time with humus. You want to know what is required to become disciples of the Word of God, of the Messiah, Word of the Father, who has come to gather Israel together, that it may hear once again the words of the holy and immutable Decalogue and may be sanctified by them, and thus be purified for the hour of redemption and of the kingdom, as far as man can be purified by himself. Now I say to the deaf, the blind, the dumb, the lepers, the paralytic, the dead, Rise, you are healed. Rise, walk. May the rivers of light, of words, of sounds be opened for you that you may see and hear me and speak of me. But rather than your bodies, I am speaking to your souls. Men of goodwill, come to me without any fear. If your souls are injured, I will cure them. If they are ill, I will heal them. If they are dead, I will raise them. All I want is your goodwill. Is what I ask for difficult? No, it is not. I do not impose on you the hundreds of precepts of the rabbis. I say to you, follow the Decalogue. The law is one and immutable. Many centuries have gone by since it was given. Beautiful, pure, fresh, like a newborn creature, like a rose just opened on its stem. Simple, neat, easy to follow. Throughout centuries, faults and trends have complicated it with many minor laws, with burdens and restrictions, with too many painful clauses. I am bringing once again the law to you as the Most High gave it. But, in your own interest, 
I ask you to accept it with sincere hearts, like the true Israelites of bygone times. You grumble more in your hearts than with your lips, that it is the fault of people in the upper classes rather than of humble people. I know. Deuteronomy states what is to be done. Nothing else was necessary. But do not judge those who acted for other people, not for themselves. Do what God commands. And above all, strive and be perfect in the two main precepts. If you love God with all your souls, you will not sin, because sin gives pain to God. Who loves does not want to give pain. If you love your neighbours as you love yourselves, you will be respectful children to your parents, faithful husbands to your wives, honest merchants in your trade, without any violence against your enemies, truthful in bearing witness, without envy of wealthy people, without any incentive of lewdness for another man's wife. And as you do not want to do to other people what you do not wish should be done to you, you will not steal or kill or slander or enter someone else's nest like cuckoos. Nay, I say to you, carry to perfection your obedience to the two precepts of love. Love also your enemies. How much the Most High will love you since he loves man so much. Although man became his enemy because of the original sin and because of his personal sins, he sent man, the Redeemer, the Lamb who is his Son, that is I, who am speaking to you. The Messiah promised to redeem you from all your sins, if you will learn to love as he does. Love. May your love become a ladder by which, like angels, you will ascend to heaven, as Jacob saw them. When you hear the Father say to each and everybody, I will be your protector wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this place, to heaven, the eternal kingdom. Peace be with you. The crowds utter words of emotional approval and slowly go away. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, and Bartholomew, stay. Are you leaving tomorrow, Master? Tomorrow, at dawn, if you do not mind. I am sorry that you are going away, but I do not mind the hour. On the contrary, it suits me. Are you going fishing? Yes, tonight, when the moon rises. You did well, Simon, not fishing last night. The Sabbath was not yet finished. Nehemiah, in his Reformation, wants the Sabbath to be respected in Judah. Even nowadays, too many people work on the Sabbath day at presses, carry wood, wine and fruit, and buy and sell fish and lambs. You have six days for that. The Sabbath is of the Lord. Only one thing you may do on the Sabbath. You may do good to your neighbour. But all profit must be excluded from such help. Who infringes the Sabbath to make a profit will be punished by God. He makes a profit, he will lose it during other six days. He makes no profit, he has fatigued his body to no purpose, because he did not grant it the rest that intelligence prescribed for it, and thus he irritated his soul, having worked in vain, and goes to the extent of cursing. The day of the Lord, instead, is to be spent with your hearts united to God in sweet prayer of love. You must be faithful in everything. But scribes and doctors, who are so severe with us, do not work on Sabbath days. They do not even give a piece of bread to their neighbours to avoid the fatigue of handing it over. But they practice usury also on a Sabbath, as it is not a material work. It is legal to practice usury on a Sabbath? No, never. Neither on a Sabbath nor any other day. Who practices usury is dishonest and cruel. The scribes and the Pharisees, then, Simon, 
Don't judge. Do not do it. But I have eyes to see. Is there only evil to be seen, Simon? No, master. Well, then, why look at evil deeds? You are right, master. Well, tomorrow morning at dawn I will leave with John. Master? Yes, Simon, what is it? Master, are you going to Jerusalem? You know I am. Also, I am going at Passover, and also Andrew and James. Well, do you mean that you would like to come with me? And your fishing, and your profit? You told me that you like to have money, and I will be away for many days. I am going to my mother's first, and I will go there also on my way back. I will stop there to preach. How will you manage? Peter is perplexed, undecided. Then he makes up his mind. Think, I will come. I prefer you to money. I'm coming too, and so am I. We're going too, aren't we, Philip? Come then, you will help me. <gasps> oh! Peter is more excited at the idea of helping Jesus. How shall we do that? I will tell you. To do good, all you need to do is do what I tell you. Who obeys always does good. We will now pray and then each of us will go and perform his duties. What will you do, Master? I will continue to pray. I am the light of the world. But I am also the Son of Man. I must therefore draw from the light to become the man who redeems man. Let us pray. Jesus says a psalm, the one beginning, who rests in the help of the Most High will live in the protection of the God of heaven. He will say to the Lord, You are my protector and my shelter. He is my God. I will hope in him. He rescued me from the snares of fowlers and from harsh words, etc. I find it in the fourth book. It is the second psalm in book four. I think it is number 90, if I read the Roman number correctly. The vision ends thus. The poem of the man-god, the first year of the public life. Chapter 51 Judas Thaddeus at Bethsaida to invite Jesus to the wedding at Cana. 17th of October, 1944. I see the kitchen in Peter's house. In addition to Jesus, there are Peter and his wife, James and John. I think they have just finished eating their supper. They are talking and Jesus takes an interest in fishing. Andrew enters and says, Master, there is the man here, in whose house you are living, together with another man, who says he is your cousin. Jesus gets up and goes towards the door, saying, Let them come in. And when he sees Judas Thaddeus in the light of the oil lamp and of the fireplace, he exclaims, You, Judas? Yes, Jesus. They kiss each other. Judas Thaddeus is a handsome man, in the fullness of his virile manhood. He is tall, although not quite so tall as Jesus, well built and strong, of a dark brown olive complexion, like Saint Joseph when young, but not sallow. His eyes have something in common with those of Jesus, because they are blue, verging on periwinkle. His brown beard is squarely cut, his hair wavy, but not so curly as Jesus's, and is the same hue as his beard. I have come from Capernaum. I went there by boat, and I have come here in the same boat to gain time. Your mother sends me. She said, Susanna is getting married tomorrow. Please come to the wedding. Mary will be there, and also my mother and brothers. All the relatives have been invited. You would be the only one absent, and they ask you to come and make the young couple happy. Jesus bows lightly, stretching out his arms, and says, a wish of my mother is a law for me, but I will come also for Susanna and our relative's sake. Only, I am sorry for you. 
and he looks at Peter and the others. They are my friends, he explains to his cousin, and then he mentions their names, beginning with Peter's. He then adds, and this is John, with a special expression that causes Judas Thaddeus to look at him more carefully, while the beloved disciple blushes. He ends the introduction, stating, My friends, this is Judas, son of Alphaeus, my cousin according to the custom of the world, because he is the son of the brother of my mother's spouse, a very good friend of mine, and a companion both in life and in work. My house is open to you as it is to the master. Sit down. And then addressing Jesus, Peter says, So, are we no longer going to Jerusalem with you? Of course you will come. I will go after the wedding feast. The only difference is that I will not stop at Nazareth any longer. Quite right, Jesus, because your mother is my guest for a few days. That is what we intend to do. She also will come there after the wedding. It is the man from Capernaum who speaks thus. This is what we'll do. I will now go in Judas's boat to Tiberias and from there to Cana. With the same boat, I will come back to Capernaum with my mother and with you. You will come the day after the next Sabbath, Simon, if you still wish to come, and we will go to Jerusalem for Passover. Of course I want to come. Nay, I will come on the Sabbath to hear you in the synagogue. Are you already teaching, Jesus? asks Thaddeus. Yes, my cousin. And you should hear his words. Ah, oh, no one else speaks like him, exclaims Peter. Judas sighs. With his head resting on his hand, his elbow on his knee, he looks at Jesus and sighs. He seems anxious to speak but does not dare. Jesus encourages him. What is the matter, Judas? Why do you look at me and sigh? Nothing. No, it must be something. Am I no longer the Jesus of whom you were fond? From whom you had no secrets? Of course you are. And how I miss you. You, the master of your older cousin. Well then, speak. I wanted to tell you, Jesus, be careful. You have a mother. She is but you. You want to be a rabbi, different from the others, and you know better than I do that, that the powerful classes do not allow anything which may differ from the customary laws they have laid down. I know your ways of thinking. It is a holy one, but the world is not holy, and it oppresses saints. Jesus, you know the fate of your cousin, the Baptist. He is in jail. And if he is not yet dead, it is because of that evil tetrarch is afraid of the crowds and of the wrath of God. As evil and superstitious is cruel and lustful, you, what are you going to do? To what fate are you going to expose yourself? Judas, you are so familiar with my way of thinking, and that is what you ask me? Are you speaking on your own initiative? No, don't lie. You have been sent, certainly not by my mother, to tell me such things. Judas lowers his head and becomes silent. Speak, cousin. My father and Joseph and Simon are with him, you know, for your sake, because they are fond of you and Mary. Do not look favourably on what you intend doing, and, and they would like you to think of your mother. And what do you think? I, I, you're drawn in opposite directions by the voices coming from high above, and those coming from the world. I am not saying from below, I say from the world. The same applies to James, even more so. But I tell you that above the world there is heaven, and above the interest of the world there is the cause of God. You must change your ways of thinking. When you learn to do that, you will be perfect. But, and your mother, Judas, she is the only one who, according to the way of thinking of the world, should be entitled to recall me 
to my duty as a son. That is, to my duty to work for her and to provide for her material needs and to my duty to assist and comfort her with my presence. But she does not ask for any of these things. Since she had me, she knew she would lose me to find me once again in a much wider manner than the small family circle. And since then, she has prepared herself for that. Her unreserved, voluntary donation of herself to God is nothing new. Her mother offered her in the temple before she even smiled at life. And as she told me innumerable times, she spoke to me of her holy childhood, holding me close to her heart in the long winter evenings or in the clear starry summer nights. She gave herself to God since the dawn of her life in this world. And she gave herself even more when she had me, that she might be where I am, fulfilling the mission given to me by God. Everybody will abandon me at a certain moment, perhaps only for a few minutes, but everyone will be overcome by cowardice, and you will think that it would have been better for your own safety if you had never known me. But she, who understood and knows, she will always be with me, and you will become mine once again through her. With the power of her unshaken, loving faith, she will draw you to herself, and will thus bring you to me, because I am in my mother, and she is in me, and we are in God. I would like you all to understand that, both you, who are my relatives according to the world, and you, friends and children in a supernatural way. Neither you nor anyone else know who my mother is, but if you knew, you would not criticise her in your heart, stating she is not capable of keeping me subject to her, but you would venerate her as the closest friend of God, the mighty woman who can obtain all graces from the heart of the Eternal Father and from her beloved Son. I will certainly come to Karna. I want to make her happy. You will understand better after the wedding. Jesus is majestic and persuasive. Judas gazes at him. He's thinking. He then says, And I will certainly come with you, with these friends, if you want me, because I feel that what you say is right. Forgive my blindness and my brothers. You are so much holier than we are. I bear no grudge against those who do not know me. I am also without ill feeling towards those who hate me. But I feel sorry for them because of the harm they do themselves. What have you got in that satchel? Your tunic your mother sent you. It is a big feast tomorrow. She thinks that her Jesus will need it, so that he may not look out of place amongst all the guests. She worked from early morning to late night every day to have it ready for you. But she did not finish the mantle. Its fringes are not yet ready, and she is very sorry about it. It does not matter. I will wear this one, and I will keep that one for Jerusalem. The temple is much more important than a wedding feast. She will be so happy. If you want to be um, on the way to Karna at dawn, you ought to leave at once. The moon is rising, and it will be a pleasant crossing, says Peter. Let us go, then. Come, John. I am taking you with me. Goodbye, Simon Peter, James, Andrew. I will see you on the Sabbath evening at Capernaum. Goodbye. Goodbye, woman. Peace be with you and your house. Jesus goes out with Judas and John. Peter follows them as far as the lake and helps them cast off. And the vision ends. Jesus says, When it is time to arrange the work in order, insert the vision of the wedding at Cana here. Put in the date, 16th of January. 1944. The Poem of the Man God, the First Year of the Public Life. Chapter 52 Jesus at the Wedding at Cana. The Evening of 16th of January 1944. I see a house, a typical Middle East house, a long, low, white house 
with few windows and doors, with a terraced roof surrounded by a little wall, about one metre high, with a shady vine pergola, which reaches up to the sunny terrace and stretches its branches over more than half of its surface. An outside staircase climbs up along the front, reaching up to a door, which is situated halfway up the facade. At ground level, there are a few low doors, not more than two on each side of the house, and they open into low, dark rooms. The house is built in the middle of what it looks like a kind of threshing floor, but is actually more a grassy open space than a threshing floor with a well in its centre. There are some fig and apple trees. The house faces the road, but it is not set right on the roadside. It is a little way off the road, and a path along the grass links it to the road, which looks like a main road. It seems to be on the outskirts of Karna, a house owned by farmers who live in the middle of their holding. The country stretches calm and green far beyond the house. The sun is shining in a completely blue sky. At first I do not see anything else. There is no one near the house. Then I see two women with long dresses and mantles that also cover their heads like veils, walking along the road and then on the path. One is older than the other, about 50 years old, with a dark dress, the grey-brown hue of raw wool. The other woman is wearing lighter garments, a pale yellow dress and a blue mantle. She looks about 35 years old. She is really beautiful, slender, and her carriage is most dignified. Although she is most kind and humble, when she is nearer, I notice her pale face, her blue eyes, and her blonde hair visible on her forehead. I recognize our most holy lady. I do not know who the other older woman is. They are speaking to each other, and our lady smiles. When they are near the house, someone who is obviously watching the arrival of the guests informs the others in the house and two men and two women, all in their best clothes, go to meet them. They give the two women, and particularly Our Lady, a most warm welcome. It is early morning. I would say about nine o'clock, perhaps earlier, because the country has the fresh look of the early morning hours, when the dew makes the grass look greener and the air is still free from dust. It appears to be springtime because the grass in the meadows is not parched by the summer sun and the corn in the fields is still young and green and earless. The leaves of the fig tree and apple tree are green and tender and those of the vines are the same. But I see no flowers on the apple tree and there is no fruit on the apple and fig tree or on the vines, which means that the apple tree blossomed only recently and the little fruits cannot be seen as yet. Mary, who is most warmly welcomed and is escorted by an elderly man who appears to be the landlord, climbs up the outside staircase and enters a large hall, which seems to fill the whole of the house upstairs, or most of it. If I am correct, the rooms on the ground floor are the ones where they actually live, where they have their storeroom, wine cellar, whereas the hall upstairs is used on special occasions, such as feast days, of a task which require a lot of space, such as drying and pressing foodstuffs. For special celebrations, the hall is cleared of every object and then decorated, as it is today, with green branches, mats and tables, prepared with rich dishes. In the centre, there is a richly laid table with amphorae and plates full of fruit. Along the right-hand side wall, in respect to me, there is another table already prepared, but not so sumptuously. On the left-hand side, there is a kind of long dresser with plates of cheese and other foodstuff, which look like cakes covered with honey and sweet meats. On the floor, near the same wall, there are more amphorae and six large vases, shaped more or less like copper pitchers. I would call them jars. Mary listens benignly to what they are telling her. Then she takes off her mantle and kindly helps to finish laying the tables. I see her going to and fro, sorting out the bed seats, 
straightening up the wreaths of flowers, improving the appearance of the fruit dishes, making sure that the lamps are filled with oil. She smiles, speaks very little and in a very low voice. Instead, she listens a lot and with so much patience. A loud sound of musical instruments, not very harmonious, is heard coming from the road. They all rush out, with the exception of Mary. I see the bride come in, smartly dressed and happy, surrounded by relatives and friends. The bridegroom, who was the first to rush out and meet her, is now beside her. At this point, there is a change in the vision. Instead of the house, I see a village. I do not know whether it is Karna or a nearby village, and I see Jesus with John and another man, who I think is Judas Thaddeus, but I might, may be wrong. I am sure about John. Jesus is wearing a white tunic and a dark blue mantle. When he hears the sound of the instruments, Jesus' companion questions a man about something and then tells Jesus. Then Jesus, smiling, says, let us go and make my mother happy. And he starts walking across the fields towards the house with his two companions. I forgot to mention that it is my impression that Mary is either a relation or a close friend of the bridegroom's relatives because she is on familiar terms with them. When Jesus arrives, the same watchman as before informs the others. The landlord with his son, the bridegroom, and Mary goes down to meet him and greets him respectfully. He then greets the other two, and so does the bridegroom. But what I like is the loving and respectful way in which Jesus and Mary exchange their greetings. There are no effusions, but the words, peace be with you, are pronounced with a look and a smile worth 100 embraces and 100 kisses. A kiss trembles on Mary's lips, but it is not given. She only lays her little white hand on Jesus' shoulder and lightly touches a curl of his long hair, the caress of a chaste lover. Jesus climbs the staircase beside his mother, followed by his disciples. The landlord and the groom enters the banquet hall where the women start bustling about adding seats and plates for the three guests, who apparently were not expected. I would say that Jesus' coming was uncertain, and the arrival of his companions was completely unforeseen. I can distinctly hear the master's full, trial, most sweet voice saying on entering the hall, May peace be in this house and the blessing of God on you all the greeting of majesty addressed to all the people present. Jesus dominates everybody with his bearing and his height. He is a guest and a casual one, but he seems to be the king of the banquet, more than the groom, more than the landlord. No matter how humble and obliging, he is the one who dominates influential friends. The two disciples are also invited to sit at the same table out of respect for Jesus. Jesus' back is turned to the wall where the large jars and the dresses are. He therefore cannot see them, neither can he see the steward bustling about the dishes of roast meat, which are brought in through a little door near the dresser. I notice one thing. With the exception of the mothers of the young couple and of Mary, no woman is sitting at that table. All the women who are making a din worthy of 100 people are sitting at the other table near the wall and are served after the young couple and the guests of importance. Jesus is sitting near the landlord in front of Mary, whose place is near the bride. The banquet starts, and I can assure you that they lack neither appetite nor thirst. The ones who eat and drink little are Jesus and his mother, who speaks also very little. Jesus talks a little more, but although very moderate, he is neither sullen nor disdainful in the little he says. He is kind, but not talkative. He answers when he is questioned. When they speak to him, he takes an interest in the subject. He states his opinion, 
but then he concentrates on his thoughts, like one accustomed to meditation. He smiles. He never laughs. If he hears any inconsiderate joke, he pretends he has not heard. Mary is nourished by the contemplation of her Jesus, and so is John, who is at the end of the table and hangs on his master's lips. Mary notices that the servants are talking in low voices to the steward, who looks very embarrassed, and she understands what the cause of the unpleasant situation is. Son, she whispers in a low voice, thus drawing Jesus' attention. Son, they have no more wine. Woman, what is there still between me and you? Jesus, when saying these words, smiles even more gently, and Mary smiles too. Like two people aware of some truth which is their joyful secret and is ignored by everyone else. Jesus explains the meaning of the sentence to me. That still, which is omitted by many translators, is the key word of the sentence and explains its true meaning. I was the son, submissive to my mother, up to the moment when the will of my father told me that the hour had come when I was to be the master. From the moment my mission started, I was no longer the son submissive to my mother because I was the servant of God. My moral ties with my mother were broken. They had turned into higher bonds, all of a spiritual nature. I always called Mary my holy mother. Our love suffered no interruptions, neither did it even cool down. Nay, it was never so perfect as when I was separated from her as by a second birth, and she gave me to the world and for the world, as the Messiah and Evangelizer. Her third sublime mystical maternity took place when she bore me to the cross on the torture of Golgotha and made me the Redeemer of the world. What is there still between me and you? Before I was yours, only yours. You gave me orders and I obeyed you. I was subject to you. Now, I belong to my mission. I did not say, he who lays his hand on the plough and looks back to bid farewell to those who are staying is not fit for the kingdom of God. I had laid my hand on the plough, not to cut the ground with the ploughshare, but to open the hearts of men and sow there the word of God. I was to take my hand away from the plough, only when they would tear it away to nail it to the cross, and to open with my torturing nail my father's heart, out of which forgiveness for mankind was to follow. That, still forgotten by most, meant this. You were everything for me, mother, as long as I was only Jesus of Mary of Nazareth, and you are everything in my spirit. But since I became the expected Messiah, I belong to my Father. Wait for a little while, and once my mission is over, I will be once again entirely yours. You will hold me once again in your arms, as when I was a little child, and no one will ever again contend with you for your son. Considered as the disgrace of mankind who will throw his mortal remains at you, to bring on you the shame of being the mother of a criminal. And afterwards, you will have me once again, triumphant. And finally, you will have me forever, when you are triumphant in heaven. But now, I belong to all these men, and I belong to the Father who sent me to them. This is the sense of that short, but so full of meaning, still. Mary says to the servants, do what he will tell you. In the smiling eyes of her son, Mary has read his consent, 
veiled by the great teaching to all those who are called. And Jesus says to the servants, fill the jars with water. I see the servants filling the jars with water brought from the well. I hear the pulley screeching as the dripping pail is pulled up and lowered down. I see the steward pour out some of the liquid with astonished eyes, then taste it with gestures of even greater astonishment, relish it and speak to the landlord and the groom. Mary looks at her son once again and smiles. Then, having received a smile from him, she bows her head, blushing slightly. She is happy. A murmur spreads throughout the hall. They all turn their heads towards Jesus and Mary. Some stand up to get a better view. Some go near the jars. Then a moment's silence, which is immediately broken up by an outburst of praises for Jesus. He stands up and simply says, Thank Mary, and withdraws from the banquet. His disciples follow him. On the threshold, he repeats, May peace be in this house and God's blessing on you. And he adds, Goodbye, Mother. The vision ends. Jesus teaches me as follows. When I said to my disciples, let us go and make my mother happy, I had given the sentence a deeper meaning than it seemed. I did not mean the happiness of seeing me, but the joy of being the initiatress of my miraculous activity and the first benefactress of mankind. Always remember that. My first miracle happened because of Mary, the very first one. It is a symbol that Mary is the key to miracles. I never refuse my mother anything, and because of her prayer, I bring forward also the time of grace. I know my mother, the second in goodness after God. I know that to grant you a grace is to make her happy because she is all love. That is why I said, knowing her, let us go and make her happy. Besides, I wanted to make her power known to the world together with mine. Since she was destined to be joined to me in the flesh, it was fair she should be joined to me in the power that is shown to the world. Because we were one flesh, I in her, she around me, like the petals of a lily, round scented lively pistol, and she was united to me in sorrow, because we were both on the cross, I with my body, she with her soul. As a lily is scented because of its corolla and because of the essence extracted from it. I say to you what I said to the other guests, thank Mary, it is through her that you had with you the master of the miracle and you have my graces, particularly those of forgiveness. Rest in peace. We are with you. The Poem of the Man God The First Year of the Public Life Chapter 53 Jesus Drives the Merchants Out of the Temple 24th of October, 1944 I see Jesus entering the enclosure of the temple with Peter, Andrew, John, James, Philip and Bartholomew. There is a very large crowd, both inside and outside the enclosure. Pilgrims are arriving in flocks from every part of town. From the top of the hill on which the temple is built, one can see the narrow, twisted streets of the town swarming with people. One gets the impression that a self-moving, many-coloured ribbon has been laid between the white houses. The town looks like a rare toy indeed, a toy made of gaily coloured ribbons between two white threads, all converging on the point where the domes of the house of the Lord are shining. Inside it is a real market. The concentration of a holy place has been 
destroyed. Some run, some call, some contract for lambs, shouting and cursing because of the extortionate prices. Some drive the poor bleating animals into their enclosures, rough partitions made of ropes and pegs, at the entrance of which stands the merchants or owners waiting by us. Blows with cudgels, bleatings, curses, shouts, insults to the boys who are not prompt in gathering together or selecting the animals, abuses to the purchasers who haggle over prices or who go away, graver insults to those who wisely brought their own lambs. Near the benches of the money changers there is more bawling. It is obvious that either always or at Passover time the temple functioned as a stock exchange or black market. There was no fixed rate of exchange. There must have been a legal rate, but the money changers imposed a different one, making whatever profit they fancied for exchanging the money. And I can assure you, they were not joking in their usury transactions. The poorer the people were, and the farther they came from, the more they were fleeced. Old people more than young people, those coming from beyond Palestine more than the old folk. Some poor old men looked over and over again at the money they had saved in a whole year. I wonder with how much hard work they took it out and put it back into their purses dozens and dozens of times, going from one money changer to another, and at times ending up by going back to the first one, who avenged himself for their original desertion by increasing the premium for the exchange. And the big coins passed from the hands of the sighing owners into the clutches of the usurers, and were changed into smaller coins. Then a further tragedy would take place with vendors over the choice and payment of their lands, and the poor old men, particularly if they were half-blind, were fobbed off with the most wretched little lambs. I see an old couple, man and wife, come back pushing a little poor lamb, which must have been found forty by the sacrifices. They cried and begged the vendor, who, far from being moved, replied with the nasty words and rude manners. Considering what you want to spend, Galilean, the lamb I gave you is even too good. Go away! Or if you want a better one, you must pay five more coins. In the name of God, we are poor and old. Are you going to prevent us from celebrating this Passover, which may be our last one? Are you not satisfied with what you wanted for a poor little lamb? Go away, you filthy lot! Joseph the Elder is now coming here. I enjoy his favour. God be with you, Joseph. Come and make your choice. The man whose name is Joseph the Elder, that is, Joseph of Arimathea, enters the enclosure and picks a magnificent lamb. He passes by stately and proud, magnificently dressed, without even looking at the poor old couple, weeping at the gate. That is the enclosure entrance. He almost bumps into them when he goes out with the fat, bleating lamb. But Jesus also is now nearby. He also has made his purchase, and Peter, who probably bargained for him, is pulling a fairly good lamb. Peter would like to go at once where they offer the sacrifices, but Jesus turns to the right, towards the dismayed, weeping, undecided old couple who are knocked about by the crowds and insulted by the vendor. Jesus, who is so tall that the heads of the poor old souls reach only up to his heart, lays one hand on the shoulder of the woman and asks her, Why are you crying, woman? The little old woman turns round and she sees the young, tall, stately man wearing a beautiful new white tunic and a snow-white mantle. She must think he is a doctor because of his garments and his aspects and is greatly surprised because doctors and priests pay no attention to the poor, neither do they protect them from the stinginess of merchants. 
she explains to Jesus the reason for their tears. Jesus addresses the lamb vendor. Change this lamb for these believers. It is not worthy of the altar. Neither is it fair that you should take advantage of two poor old people only because they are weak and unprotected. And who are you? A just man. By your way of speaking and your companions, I know you're a Galilean. Can there be a just man in Galilee? Do what I told you, and be a just man yourself. Listen! Listen to the Galilean who is defending his equals, and he wants to teach us of the temple. The man laughs and jeers, imitating the Galilean accent, which is more musical and softer than the Judean, at least, I think so. Many people go near them, and other merchants and money changers take their companion's part against Jesus. Amongst the people present, there are two or three ironical rabbis. One of them asks, Are you a doctor? In such a way that even Jog would lose his temper. Yes, I am. What do you teach? This I teach. To make the house of God a house of prayer, and not a usury or a marketplace. That is what I teach. Jesus is formidable. He looks like the archangel posted on the threshold of Eden. He has no flashing sword in his hand, but the beams from his eyes strike the impious mockers like lightning. Jesus has nothing in his hands. All he has is his wrath, and full of wrath, he walks fast and solemn between the benches. He scatters the coins which had been sorted out so meticulously according to their values. He turns over the benches and tables, and everything falls on the ground with great noise. In the bustle of rebounding metals and beaten wood, angry cries, shrieks of terror, and shouts of approval. He then snatches from the hands of the stable boys some ropes with which they were holding oxen, sheep, and lambs, and he makes a very hard lash in which the slipknots are really scourges. He lifts it, swings it, and strikes mercilessly with it. Yes, I can assure you, mercilessly. The unforeseen storm hits heads and backs. The believers move to one side, admiring the scene. The guilty ones, chased as far as the external wall, take to their heels, leaving their money on the ground and abandoning in a great confusion of legs, horns and wings, their animals, some of which run and fly away. The bellows, bleatings, the fluttering of turtle doves and pigeons, added to the burst of laughter and shouting of the believers at the escaping usurers, overcome even the plaintive chorus of lambs slaughtered in another yard. Priests, rabbis and Pharisees rush to the spot. Jesus is still in the middle of the yard. On his way back from the chase, the lash is still in his hands. Who are you? How dare you do that, upsetting the prescribed ceremonies? From which school are you? We do not know you. Neither do we know where you come from. I am he who is mighty. I can do anything. Destroy this true temple and I will raise it to give praise to God. I am not upsetting the holiness of the house of God or of the ceremonies, but you are perturbing it allowing his house to become the center of usurers and merchants. My school is the school of God, the same school as the whole of Israel had when the eternal God spoke to Moses. You do not know me, you will know me. You do not know where I come from, you will learn. And turning towards the people, without noticing the priests any longer, tall in his white tunic, with his mantle open and blowing behind his back, his arms stretched out like an orator. At the most important part of his speech, he says, Listen, Israel! In Deuteronomy, it is said, You are to appoint judges and scribes at all the gates, 
and they must administer an impartial judgment to the people. You must be impartial. You must take no bribes, for a bribe blinds wise men's eyes and jeopardizes the cause of the just. Strict justice must be your ideal, so that you may live in rightful possession of the land that Yahweh your God is giving you. Listen, Israel. In Deuteronomy, it is said, the priests and scribes and the whole of the tribe of Levi shall have no share or inheritance with Israel because they must live on the foods offered to Yahweh and on his dues. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers because Yahweh will be their inheritance. Listen, Israel. In Deuteronomy, it is said, you must not lend on interest to your brother whether the lack be of money or food or anything else. You may demand interest on a loan of a foreigner. You will lend without interest to your brother whatever he needs. The Lord said that, but now you see that in Israel, judgments are administered without justice for the poor. They are not inclined to justice, but they are partial with the rich and to the poor. To be of the common people means to be oppressed. How can the people say our judges are just when they see that only the mighty ones are respected and satisfied, whereas the poor have no one who will listen to them? How can the people respect the Lord when they see that the Lord is not respected by those who should respect him more than everyone else. Does he who infringes the Lord's commandment respect him? Why then do the priests in Israel possess property and accept bribes from tax collectors and sinners who make them offerings to obtain their favors while they accept gifts to fill their coffers? God is the inheritance of his priests he, the father of Israel, is more than a father to them and provides them with food as it is just, but not more than what is just. He did not promise money and possessions to his servants of the sanctuary. In eternal life, they will possess heaven for their justice, as Moses, Elijah, Jacob and Abraham will. But in this world, they must have but a linen garment and a diadem of incorruptible gold, purity and charity. And their bodies must be subject to their souls, which are to be subject to the true God. And their bodies are not to be masters over the souls and against God. I have been asked, on what authority I do this? And on what authority do they violate God's command and allow in the shade of the sacred walls usury on their brothers of Israel who have come to obey the divine command? I have been asked from what school I come, and I replied, from God's school. Yes, Israel, I have come from, and I will take you back to that holy and immutable school. Who wants to know the light, the truth, the way? Who wants to hear once again the voice of God speaking to his people? Let him come to me. You followed Moses through the deserts, Israel. Follow me, because I shall lead you through a far worse desert, to the true blessed land. At God's command, I will draw you to it across an open sea. I will cure you of all evils, lifting up my sign. The time of grace has come. The prophets expected it and died wanting for it. The prophets prophesied it and died in that hope. The just have dreamt of it and died comforted by that dream. It is now here. Come. 
The Lord is about to judge his people and have mercy on his servants, as he promised through Moses. The people crowding round Jesus stand open-mouthed, listening to him. Then they comment on the new rabbi's words and ask his companions questions. Jesus goes to another yard, separated from this one only by a porch. His friends follow him, and the vision ends. The Poem of the Man God The First Year of the Public Life Chapter 54 Jesus meets Judas Iscariot and Thomas and cures Simon the Zealot. 26th of October, 1944 Jesus is together with his six disciples. Neither the other day nor today have I seen Judas Thaddeus, who said he wanted to come to Jerusalem with Jesus. It must still be past over time, because there is always a lot of people in town. It is evening, and many people are hurrying home. Jesus also goes towards the house where he is a guest. It is not the house of the Last Supper, which is in town, although not far from its walls. This house instead is a real country house amongst thick olive trees. From the rustic open space in front of the house, one can see the olive trees down the terraces of the hill, right down to a little torrent with very little water, which flows away along the valley formed by two hills. On top of one there is the temple, on the other hill, there are only olive trees. Jesus is at the first slopes of the latter hill, which rises smoothly, completely covered with peaceful trees. John, there are two men awaiting your friend, says an elderly man who must be the farmer or the owner of the olive grove. I would say that John knows him. Where are they? Who are they? I don't know. One is certainly a Judean. The other, I don't know. I didn't ask him. Where are they? In the kitchen, waiting. And, and yes, there is another man who is all covered with sores. I made him stay over there because I am afraid he may be a leper. He says he wants to see the prophet who spoke in the temple. Jesus, who up to this moment has been silent, says, Let us go to him first. Tell the others to come if they wish so. I will speak to them there in the olive grove. And he makes for the place indicated by the man. And what about us? What shall we do? asks Peter. Come if you want. A man, muffled up, is leaning against the rustic wall supporting a terrace, the nearest to the boundary of the property. He must have climbed up there along a path coasting the torrent. When he sees Jesus approaching him, he shouts, Go back, go back! Have mercy on me! And he uncovers his trunk, dropping his tunic to the ground. If his face is covered with scabs, his trunk is one Big sore. Some of the sores have already become deep wounds. Some are like burns. Some are whitish and glossy, as if there was a thin white pane of glass on them. Are you a leper? What do you want of me? Don't curse me. Don't stone me. I have been told that the other evening... You revealed yourself as the voice of God and the bearer of grace. I was also told that you gave assurance that by raising your sign, you will cure all diseases. Please raise it on me. I have come from the sepulchres over there. I crept like a snake amongst the bushes near the torrent to arrive here without being seen. I waited until evening before leaving, because at dusk it is more difficult to see who I am. I dared. I found this man, the man of the house. He is good. He did not kill me. He only said, 
Wait over there near the little wall. Have mercy on me. And as Jesus is going near him, all by himself, because the six disciples and the landlord, as well as the two strangers, are far away and are evidently disgusted, he adds, Don't come nearer! Don't! I am infected! But Jesus proceeds. He looks at him so mercifully that the man starts crying and kneels down, almost touching the ground with his face, moaning, Your son! Your side. It will be raised when it is time. But now I say to you, stand up. Be healed. I want it. And be the sign in this town that must recognize me. Rise, I say. And do not sin out of gratitude to God. The man rises slowly. He seems to emerge from the long, flowery grass as from a shroud and is healed. He looks at himself in the last dim light of day. He's healed. He shouts, I am clean. Oh, what shall I do for you now? You must comply with the law. Go to the priest. Be good in future. Go. The man is on the point of throwing himself at Jesus' feet, but he remembers he is still impure according to the law, and he restrains himself. But he kisses his own hand and throws a kiss to Jesus and weeps. He weeps out of joy. The others are dumbfounded. Jesus turns away from the healed man and rouses them, smiling. My friends, it was only a leprosy of the flesh. But you will see leprosy fall from hearts. Is it you that wanted me? He asks the two strangers. Here I am. Who are you? We heard you the other evening in, in the temple. We, we looked for you in town. A, a man who said he, he's a relative of yours told us you stay here. Why are you looking for me? To follow you, if you will allow us because you have words of truth. Follow me. But do you know where I am going? No, master, but certainly to glory. Yes, but not to a glory of this world. I am going to a glory which is in heaven and is conquered by virtue and sacrifice. Why do you want to follow me? He asks them again. To take part in your glory. According to heaven? Yes, according to heaven. Not everybody is able to arrive there, because mammon lays more snares for those yearning for heaven than for the others. And only he who has strong willpower can resist. Why follow me, if to follow me implies a continuous struggle against the enemy, which is in us? against the hostile world and against the enemy who is Satan. Because that is the desire of our souls, which have been conquered by you. You are holy and powerful. We want to be your friends. Friends. Jesus is silent and sighs. Then he stares at the one who has spoken all the time, and who has now removed the mantle hood from his head, and is bareheaded. He is Judas of Kerioth. Who are you? You speak better than a man of the people. I am Judas, the son of Simon. I come from Kerioth, but I am of the temple. I am waiting for and dreaming of the king of the Jews. I have heard you speak like a king. I saw your kingly gestures. Take me with you. Take you now at once? No. Why not, Master? Because it is better to examine ourselves carefully before venturing on very steep roads. Do you not believe I am sincere? You have said it. I believe in your impulsiveness, but I do not believe in your perseverance. Think about it, Judas. 
I am going away now, and I will be back for Pentecost. If you are in the temple, you will see me. Examine yourself. And who are you? I am another one who saw you. I would like to be with you, but now I am frightened. No, presumption ruins people. Fear may be an impediment, but it is a help when it originates from humility. Do not be afraid. Think about it too. And when I come back, Master, you are so holy. I am afraid of not being worthy, nothing else, because I do not doubt my love. What is your name? Thomas of Didymus. I will remember your name. Go in peace. Jesus dismisses them and he goes into the hospitable house for supper. The six disciples who are with him want to know many things. Why, Master, did you treat them differently? Because there was a difference. Both of them had the same impulsiveness, asks John. My friend, also the same impulsiveness may have a different taste and bring about a different effect. They both certainly had the same impulsiveness, but they were not the same in their purposes, and the one who appears less perfect is, in fact, more perfect, because he has no incentive to human glory. He loves me because he loves me. And so do I. And I too. And I. And I. And I. And I. I know. I know you for what you are. And we, therefore, perfect? No, no, oh no. But like Thomas, you will become perfect if you persevere in your desire to love. Perfect? Oh, my friends, and who is perfect but God? You are. I solemnly tell you that I am not perfect by myself. If you think I am a prophet, no man is perfect. But I am perfect because he who is speaking to you is the word of the Father, part of God. His thought that becomes word. I have perfection in myself, and you must believe me to be such if you believe that I am the word of the Father. And yet see, my friends, I want to be called the Son of Man because I lower myself, taking upon myself all the miseries of man, to bear them as my first scaffold and cancel them after bearing them without suffering from them myself. What a burden, my friends, but I bear it with joy. It is a joy for me to bear it, because since I am the son of mankind, I will make mankind once again the child of God, as it was on the first day. Jesus is speaking very gently, sitting at the poor table gesticulating calmly with his hands on the table, his head slightly inclined to one side, his face lit up from below by a small oil lamp on the table. He smiles gently. He, who formerly was so majestic a master in his bearing, is now so friendly in his gestures. His disciples are listening to him carefully. Master, why did your cousin not come? although he knows where you live. My Peter, you will be one of my stones, the first one, but not all the stones can be easily used. Have you seen the marble blocks in the Praetorium building? With hard labour they have been torn away from the bosom of the mountainside and are now part of the Praetorium. Look instead at those stones down there shining in the moonlight, in the water of the Kidron. They arrived in the waterbed by themselves, and if anyone wants to take them, they do not put up any resistance. My cousin is like the first stones I am speaking of. The bosom of the mountainside, his family, they contend for him with me. But I want to be exactly like the stones in the torrent, 
I am quite prepared to leave everything for you. Home, wife, fishing, brothers, everything. Rabbani, for you. I know, Peter. That is why I love you. Also, Judas will come. Who? Judas of Carrieth? I don't care for him. He's a dandy young man, but I, I prefer... I prefer myself. They all laugh at Peter's witty remark. There is nothing to laugh at. I mean that I prefer a sincere Galilean, a rough fisherman, but without any fraud to, to, to townsfolk who, I don't know, here, the master knows what I mean. Yes, I know, but do not judge. We need one another in this world. The good are mixed with the wicked, just like flowers in a field. Hemlock grows beside the salutary mallow. I would like to ask one thing. What, Andrew? John told me about the miracle you worked at Cana. We were hoping so much that you would work one at Capernaum. And you said that you would not work any miracles before fulfilling the law. Why Cana, then? And why here, and not in our own fatherland? To obey the law is to be united to God. And that increases our capabilities. A miracle is the proof of the union with God, as well as of God's benevolent and unsenting presence. That is why I wanted to perform my duty as an Israelite before starting the series of miracles. But you were not bound to fulfill the law. Why? As the son of God, I was not. But as a son of the law, yes, I was. For the time being, Israel knows me only as such. And even later, almost everyone in Israel will know me as such. Nay, even less. But I do not want to scandalize Israel, and therefore I obey the law. You are holy. Holiness does not bar obedience. Nay, it makes obedience perfect. Besides everything else, there is a good example to be given. What would you say of a father, of an elder brother, or of a teacher, or of a priest who did not give good examples? And w what about Kana? Kana was to make my mother happy. Kana is the advance due to my mother. She anticipates grace. Here I honour the holy city, making her in public the starting point of my power as Messiah. But there, at Cana, I paid honour to the Holy Mother of God, full of grace. The world received me through her. It is only fair that my first miracle in the world should be for her. There is a knocking at the door. It is Thomas once again. He goes in and throws himself at Jesus' feet. Master, I cannot wait until you come back. Let me come with you. I am full of faults, but I have my love, my only real great treasure. It is yours. It's for you. Let me come, Master. Jesus lays his hand on Thomas's head. You may stay, Didymus. Follow me. Blessed are those who are sincere and persistent in their will. You are all blessed. You are more than relatives to me, because you are my children and my brothers, not according to the blood that dies, but according to the will of God and to your spiritual wishes. Now I tell you that I have no closer relative than those who do the will of my Father, and you do it because you want what is good. The vision ends thus. It is four o'clock p.m., and the shadows of torpor are already falling upon me. A torpidity which I perceive will be violent, a logical consequence of yesterday's painful hour. But I was also very ill on October the 24th, so much so that when the vision was over, I wrote it suffering from a headache, quite as bad as meningitis. I did not have enough strength to add that 
At last I saw Jesus dressed as he appears to me when the vision is entirely for me, wearing a soft tunic of white wool, just verging to ivory, and a mantle of the same hue. The garments he was wearing the first time he revealed himself as Messiah in Jerusalem. The Poem of the Man God The First Year of the Public Life Chapter 55 Thomas Becomes a Disciple 27th of October 1944 This morning, as I recovered my senses after a very heavy torpor, which had lasted many hours, while I was praying awaiting daylight, I saw the resumption of the vision. I say resumption because we are still in the same place, the low, wide kitchen with its dark, smoky walls, dimly lit up by the small flame of an oil lamp on the rustic table. It is a long, narrow table at which eight people are sitting, Jesus and his six disciples, and the landlord, four each side. Jesus, sitting on a stool. The only seats here are the three-legged stools, really country furniture, is still turned round speaking to Thomas. Jesus' hand has fallen from Thomas's head onto his shoulder. Jesus says, Stand up, my friend. Have you had any supper yet? No, master. I walked a few yards with the other fellow who was with me. Then I left him. And I came back, saying that I wanted to speak to the healed leper. I said that because I thought he would disdain approaching an impure man. I guessed right. But I wanted to see you, not the leper. I wanted to say to you, please, take me. I wandered up and down the olive grove until a young man asked me what I was doing. He must have thought I was ill-disposed. He was near a pillar, at the boundary of the olive grove. The landlord smiles. It's my son, he explains and adds. He's on guard at the oil mill. In the caves under the mill, we still have almost all the crop of the year. It was a very good one, and we made a lot of oil. And when there are large crowds about, robbers always get together to plunder unguarded places. Eight years ago, just at Paris Eve, they robbed us of everything. Since then, we keep a good watch one each night. His mother has gone to take him his supper. Well, he asked me, what do you want? And he spoke in such a tone that to save my back from a stick, I answered at once. I am looking for the master who lives here. He then replied, If what you say is true, come to the house. And he brought me here. It was he who knocked at the door, and he did not go away until he heard my first words. Do you live far away? I live on the other side of the town, near the eastern gate. Are you alone? I was with some relatives, but they have gone to stay with other relatives on the road to Bethlehem. I remained here to look for you day and night until I found you. Jesus smiles and says, So, no one is waiting for you? No, master. It is a long way. It is a dark night. The Roman patrols are about the town. I say, stay with us if you wish. Oh, master! Thomas is happy. Make room for him and each of us will give something to our brother. Jesus gives him the portion of cheese he had in front of him. He explains to Thomas, We are poor, and our supper is almost over, but there is so much heart in who offers. And he says to John, who is sitting beside him, Give your seat to our friend. John gets up at once and sits down at the end of the table near the landlord. Sit down, Thomas, and eat. And then he says to all of them, You will always behave like that, my friends, according to the law of charity. A pilgrim is already protected by the law of God. But now, in my name, you must love him even more. 
when anyone asks you for some bread, a drop of water, or a shelter in the name of God, you must give it in the same name, and you will receive your reward from God. You must behave so with everybody, even with your enemies, and that is the new law. Up till now you were told, love those who love you and hate your enemies. I say, love also those who hate you. Oh, if you only knew how much you will be loved by God, if you love as I am telling you. And when anyone says, I want to be your companion in serving the true Lord God and following his Lamb, then he must be dearer to you than a brother by blood, because you will be joined by an eternal bond, the bond of Christ. But if someone comes who is not sincere, it is easy to say, I want to do this or that, but words do not always correspond to the truth, says Peter, rather irritated. I do not know why, but he is not in his usual jovial mood. Peter, listen. What you say is sensible and fair. But see, it is better to exceed in bounty and trust rather than exceed in distrust and hardness. If you help an undeserving person, what harm will befall you? None. Nay, God's reward will always be active for you, whereas the person will be guilty of betraying your trust. No army! Very often a worthless person is not satisfied with ingratitude, but goes much further, even to the extreme of ruining one's reputation, wealth, and one's very life. True. But would that diminish your merit? No, it would not. Even if the whole world should believe slander, even if you became poorer than Job, even if the cruel person should take your life, what would change in the eyes of God? Nothing. Nay, something would change, but to your advantage. God, to the merits of your bounty, would add the merits of your intellectual, financial, physical martyrdom. All right, perhaps it is so. Peter does not speak any more. He sulkily rests his head on his hand. Jesus addresses Thomas. My friend, before, in the olive grove, I said to you, when I come back here, if you are still willing, you will be one of my disciples. Now, I say to you, are you willing to do Jesus a favour? Most certainly. And if this favour should cost you some sacrifice? There is no sacrifice in serving you. What is it you want? I wanted to say. But you may have some business, some affections. None, none. I have you. Tell me. Listen. Tomorrow at daybreak, the leper will leave the sepulchres to find someone who will inform the priest. You will be the first to go to the sepulchres. It is charity, and you will shout. Come out, you, the one who was cleansed yesterday. I have been sent by Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah of Israel, he who cleansed you. Let the world of the living dead know my name. Let them throb with hope, and let those come to me who will have faith in addition to hope, that I may heal them. It is the first form of purity that I am bringing, the first form of the resurrection of which I am the Lord. One day I will grant a greater purity. One day the sealed tombs will violently expel those who are really dead, and they will appear and laugh with their empty eye sockets, with their bare jaws, because of the rejoicing of the souls freed from limbo a remote rejoicing and yet perceived even by skeletons. They will appear to love because of this liberation and to throb knowing it is due. Go. He will come to you. 
You will do what he asks you to do. You will assist him in everything, as if he were your brother. And you will also say to him, When you are completely purified, we will go together along the road of the river, beyond Doko and Ephraim. Jesus the Master will be waiting for us to tell us in what we have to serve him. I will do that. And what about the other one? Who? This carriot? Yes, Master. The advice I gave him still stands. Let him decide by himself, and let him take a long time. Nay, avoid seeing him. I will be with the leper. Only lepers wander about in the valley of the sepulchres, and those who pitifully are in touch with them. Peter mumbles something. Jesus hears him. What is the matter with you, Peter? You either grumble or are silent. You seem to be discontented. Why? I am discontented. We were the first, and you did not work a miracle for us. We were the first, and you let a stranger sit beside you. We were the first, and you entrust him, not us, with a task. We were the first, and yet, yes, we seem to be the last ones. Why are you going to wait for them on the road near the river? Certainly to entrust them with some mission. Why them, and not us? Jesus looks at him. He is not angry. On the contrary, he smiles as one smiles at a child. He gets up, goes slowly over to Peter, and smiling says to him, Peter, Peter, you're a big old baby. And he says to Andrew, who is sitting beside his brother, Go and take my seat. And he sits beside Peter, clasping his shoulders with his arm, and he speaks to him, holding him thus against his own shoulder. Peter, you think I am being unfair? But I am not. On the contrary, it is a proof that I know what you are worth. Look, who needs proofs? He who is not yet certain. I knew you were so certain about me that I did not feel any need to give you evidence of my power. Proofs are required here in Jerusalem, where vices, irreligiousness, politics, and many worldly things dim souls to such an extent that they can no longer see the light passing by. But up there, on our beautiful lake, so clear under a clear sky, amongst honest and good-willing people, no proof is required. You will have miracles. I will pour torrents of graces upon you. But consider how I valued you. I took you without exacting any proof and without finding it necessary to give you any. Because I know who you are. You are dear to me, so dear and so faithful. Peter cheers up. Forgive me, Jesus. Yes, I forgive you because your sulkiness is a sign of love. But do not be envious any more, Simon of Jonas. Do you know what the heart of your Jesus is? Have you ever seen the sea? The real sea? You have? Well, my heart is bigger than the immense sea. And there is room for everybody. For the whole of mankind. And the smallest person has a place exactly as the greatest. And the sinner finds love just like an innocent. I am entrusting these with the mission. Certainly. Do you want to forbid me? I chose you. You did not choose yourselves. I am therefore free to decide how I want to employ you. And if I leave them here with a mission, which might well be a test, as the lapse of time granted to the Iscariot may be due to mercy, can you reproach me? How do you know that I am not keeping a greater mission for you? And is not the nicest mission to be told? You will come with me? It is true. I am a blockhead. Forgive me. Yes, 
I forgive everything. Oh, Peter, but I beg you all never to discuss merits and positions. I could have been born a king. I was born poor, in a stable. I could have been rich. I lived with my work, and now I live out of charity. And yet, believe me, my friends, there is no one greater than I in the eyes of God, greater than I am who am here, the servant of man. You a servant? Never! Why not, Peter? Because I will serve you. Even if you served me as a mother serves a child, I have come to serve man. I will be a saviour for him. What service is there like that? Oh, master, you explain everything, and what seemed dark becomes clear at once. Are you happy now, Peter? Now, let me finish talking to Thomas. Are you sure you will recognise the leper? He is the only one healed, but he may already have left by starlight to find an early wayfarer, and someone anxious to enter the town and see his relatives might perhaps take his place. Listen to his description. I was near him and I saw him well in the twilight. He is tall and thin, of a dark complexion, like a crossbreed, very deep and dark eyes with snow-white eyebrows, hair as white as linen and somewhat curly, and a long snubbed nose like the Libyans, two thick protruding lips, particularly the lower one. He is so olive-coloured that his lips verge on violet. He has an old scar on his forehead, and it will be the only stain now that he has been cleansed from the scabs and dirt. He must be old, if he is all white. No, Philip, he looks old, but he's not. Leprosy made him white. What is he? A crossbreed? Perhaps, Peter. He resembles African people. Will he be an Israelite, then? We will find out. But suppose he's not? Eh, uh, if he were not, he would go away. He's already lucky that he deserved to be healed. No, Peter. Even if he is an idolater, I will not send him away. Jesus has come for everybody. And I solemnly tell you that people living in darkness will overcome the children of the people of light. Jesus sighs. He then stands up. He thanks the Father with a hymn and blesses everyone. The vision ends thus. I point out incidentally that my internal adviser said to me, since yesterday evening when I saw the leper, it is Simon the Apostle. You will see him and Thaddeus coming to the master. This morning, after Holy Communion, today is Friday, I opened my missal and I saw that this is the eve of the Feast of Saints Simon and Judas, and tomorrow's Gospel deals with charity, almost repeating the very words I heard before the vision. However, I have not seen Judas Thaddeus so far. The Poem of the Man-God, The First Year of the Public Life, Chapter 56, Judas of Alphaeus, Thomas and Simon are accepted as disciples at the Jordan. 28th of October, 1944 You are beautiful, O banks of the Jordan, as beautiful as you were in the times of Jesus. I admire you and am enraptured by your solemn green-blue peas, resounding with flowing waters and leafy branches as sweet as a melody. I am on a road which is quite wide and also well maintained. It must be a highway, or more likely a military road, built by the Romans to link the various regions with the capital. It runs near the river, but not precisely along it. It is, in fact, separated from it by woodland, the function of which, I think, is to consolidate the river banks and contain the water in times of flood. The woodland continues on the other side of the road, so that the road looks like a natural tunnel over which the trees interlace their leafy branches 
a beneficial protection for wayfarers in the hot climate of this country. At the point where I am, the river, and consequently also the road, form a wide bend, so that the leafy embankment appears to me like a huge green barrier built to enclose a basin of calm waters. It almost looks like a lake in a luxury park. But the water is not as still as the water of lake. It flows, although slowly. This is evident from its rustling against the first reed thickets, the more daring ones that have grown down there in the gravel bed, and also from the undulation of the long ribbon-like leaves of the canes, reaching down to the water by which they are sweetly lulled. Also a group of willows with flexible falling branches have entrusted the ends of their green foliage to the river that combs the thin branches with a graceful caress, stretching them softly on the water surface. There is peace and silence in the early morning. One can sense only the warbling of birds, the rustling of water and leaves, the glittering of dewdrops on the tall green grass between the trees, a grass not yet hardened or parched by the summer sunshine, but tender and fresh, since it came up after the springtime showers, which nourished the earth in its very depth with moisture and rich juices. Three wayfarers are standing on the road in the middle of the bend. They look up and down to the south, where Jerusalem is, and to the north, where Samaria lies. They look anxiously between the trees to see whether anyone is arriving as expected. They are Thomas, Judas Thaddeus, and the healed leper. They are speaking. Can you see anything? No, I can't. Neither can I. And yet, this is the place. Are you sure? I'm sure, Simon. One of the six said to me, when the master was going away amid the acclamation of the crowd, after the miraculous healing of a crippled beggar who was healed at the fish gate, we are now going out of Jerusalem. Wait for us five miles between Jericho and Doko, at the bend of the river, along the road in the woodland. This one. He also said, we will be there in three days' time at dawn. This is the third day, and we have been here before dawn. Will he come? Perhaps we should have followed him from Jerusalem. You were not yet allowed to mix with the crowd, Simon. If my cousin told you to come here, he will certainly come here. He always keeps his promise. All we can do is wait. Have you always been with him? Yes, always. Since he came back to Nazareth, he was my good companion. We were always together. We are about the same age. I am a little older. And I was the favourite of his father, who was my father's brother. Also, his mother was very fond of me. I grew up more with her than with my own mother. She was fond? Is she no longer as fond of you now? Oh, yes, she is. But we have parted a little since he became a prophet. My relatives are not happy about it. Which relative? My father and the two older brothers. The other one is undecided. My father is very old, and I did not have the courage to hurt him. But now, now, no longer so. Now I am going where my heart and my mind tell me. I am going to Jesus. I don't think I am offending the law by doing so. In any case, if what I want to do was not right, Jesus would tell me. I will do what he says. Is it right for a father to prevent a son from doing good? If I feel that my salvation is there, why prevent me from reaching it? Why, at times, are our fathers our enemies? Simon sighs, as if he were overwhelmed by sad memories. He lowers his head, but does not speak. Thomas instead replies, I have already overcome the obstacle. My father listened to me and he understood me. He blessed me, saying, Go, may this Passover be for you the liberation from the slavery of waiting. You are fortunate, because you can believe. I will wait. But if it is really him, and you will find out following him, then come and say to your old father, 
Come, Israel has the expected one. You are luckier than I am, and we always lived beside him, and we in the family do not believe. We say, that is, they say, he has gone mad. There, there is a group of people, shouts Simon. It's him, it's him, I recognize his fair head. Oh, come, let us run. They start walking fast southwards. When they reach the center of the bend, the trees cover the remainder of the road, so that the two groups face each other unexpectedly. Jesus seems to be coming up from the bank, because he's among the trees on the bank. Master, Jesus, my Lord! The three cries of the disciple, the cousin and the cured leper, are full of joy and veneration. Peace to you! There is the beautiful, unmistakable, full, resonant, calm, expressive, clear, virile, sweet, incisive voice. You too, Judas, my cousin, are here? They embraced each other. Judas is weeping. Why are you weeping? Oh, Jesus, I want to stay. Stay with you. I have been waiting for you all the time. Why did you not come? Judas lowers his head and is silent. They did not let you. And now? Jesus, I... I cannot obey them. I want to obey only you. But I did not give you an order. No, you did not. But it is your mission that gives it. It is he who sent you, who is speaking here in my heart, and says to me, Go to him. It is she who bore you, my sweet teacher, who with her gentle look, as mild as a dove's, says to me without uttering a word, Be of Jesus. Can I ignore that heavenly voice that pierces my heart? Can I ignore the prayers of such a holy woman who implores me for my own good? Only because I am your cousin on Joseph's side, am I not to acknowledge you for what you are? Whereas the Baptist recognized you, although he had never seen you here, on the banks of this river, and he greeted you as the Lamb of God. And I, should I not be capable of anything, although I was brought up with you? And I was good because I followed you, and I became a son of the law through your mother, from whom I learned not the 613 precepts of the rabbis, besides the scriptures and the prayers, but the essence of them all. And your father? My father? He does not lack bread and assistance. And then, you give me the example. You have thought of the welfare of the people rather than the little advantage of Mary, and she is alone. Tell me, Master, is it not right for a son to say to his father, without lacking respect, Father, I love you, but God is above you, and I will follow him. Judas, my cousin and my friend, I tell you, you have made good progress on the way to light. Come, it is lawful to speak thus to a father when it is God who calls. There is nothing above God. Also the laws of relationship cease. That is, they are raised to a dignity. Because with our tears we give our fathers and mothers a greater help and for something everlasting, not for a short time in this world. We draw them with us to heaven and by sacrificing our affections to God. So, Judas, stay here. I have been waiting for you, and I am happy to have you, the friend of my life at Nazareth. Judas is touched. Jesus addresses Thomas. You obeyed faithfully. That is the first virtue of a disciple. I came because I want to be faithful to you, and you will be, I tell you, and you 
who are hiding shyly in the shade. Come here. Do not be afraid. My Lord! The ex-leper is at Jesus' feet. Stand up. Your name? Simon. Your family? My Lord, it was powerful. I was powerful too. But bitter sectarian hatred and errors of youth damaged its power. My father, oh, I must speak against him, who caused me to shed so many earthly tears. You see, you saw the gift he gave me. Was he a leper? He was not. Neither was I. But he suffered from another disease which we in Israel associate with various forms of leprosy. He, his caste, was then triumphant. He lived and died as a powerful man at home. I, if you had not saved me, I would have died in the Valley of Sepulchus. Are you alone? Yes, I am. I have a faithful servant who looks after what property is left. I sent word to him. And your mother? She is dead. The man seems embarrassed. Jesus looks at him attentively. Simon, you asked me, what shall I do for you? Now I say to you, follow me. I will at once, my lord, but, but, I, let me tell you one thing. I am, I, I was called zealot because of the caste, and Canaanian because of my mother. See, I am of a dark complexion. In my veins there is the blood of a slave woman. My father had no children from his wife and he had me from a slave. His wife was a good woman, and she brought me up as her th own son. She took care of me in my endless illness until she died. There are no slaves or free men in the eyes of God. There is only one slavery in his eyes, sin, and I have come to abolish it. I am calling everybody because the kingdom is of all men. Are you a learned man? Yes, I am. I also had my position amongst the important people, as long as my disease was hidden under my clothes. But when it spread to my face, my enemies then could not believe they were at last able to confine me amongst the dead. Although a Roman doctor of Caesarea when I consulted him, told me that mine was not real leprosy, but hereditary serpigo, which I would spread only by procreation. Is it possible for me not to curse my father? You must not curse him. He has caused you all sorts of trouble. Yes, he did. He was a squanderer, a vicious, cruel, heartless man, without any love. He deprived me of my health. He denied me love and peace. He branded me with a shameful name and with a disease which is a mark of infamy. He wanted everything for himself, even his son's future. He deprived me of everything, also the joy of being a father. That is why I say to you, follow me. As my followers... You will find father and children. Look up, Simon. There. The true father is smiling at you. Look at the wide world, at the continents, at the countries. There are children and children everywhere. Children of the souls for the childless. They are waiting for you. And many like you are also waiting. There are no foundlings under my sign. There is no solitude, no difference in my sign. It is a sign of love, and it gives love. Come, my childless Simon. Come, Judas, who are losing your father for my sake. 
I join you in the same destiny. They are both beside him. He is holding his hands on their shoulders as if he were taking possession of them and imposing a common yoke on them. He then says, And I unite you together, but now I will separate you. Simon, you will stay here with Thomas. You will prepare with him the way for my return. I will be back soon, and I want the people to be waiting for me. Tell the sick people that he who can cure their illnesses is about to come here. You can certainly tell them that. Tell those who are waiting that the Messiah is among his people. Tell the sinners that he who forgives has come to give them strength to rise. Will we be able to do that? Yes, you will. All you have to say is, He has come. He calls you. He is waiting for you. He has come to grant you graces. Come here to see him. And to these words, add a report of what you know. And you, Judas, my cousin, come with me and these, but you will stay at Nazareth. Why, Jesus? Because you must prepare my way in my fatherland. Do you think it is a small mission? I can tell you that there is not a harder one. Jesus sighs. And will I succeed? You will and you will not. But it will be sufficient to be justified. Justified of what? And with whom? With God. With your fatherland. With your family. They will not be able to reproach us because we offered good things. And if the fatherland and the family will disdain our offer, we shall not be blamed for their loss. And what about us? You, Peter, you will go back to your fishing nets. Why? Because I will teach you slowly and I will take you with me when I find that you are ready. But will we see you then? Certainly. I will often come to see you, or I will send for you when I am at Capernaum. Now, let us say goodbye. My friends, and let us go. I bless you who are staying here. May my peace be with you. And the vision ends. <laughs>